Hello everybody, my name is Adolfo Acosta and welcome to my channel. Now I have a podcast called the Essential Films Podcast where I do lots of different uh, classic movie reviews including Casablanca, Citizen Kane, The Godfather, all the classics. And um, I've had this YouTube channel here for a while but I haven't really used it much and I'm going to try to change that from now on. So I'm going to be reposting uh, some of my old podcast episodes as video format in here and on YouTube and I'm also going to try to come up with some new YouTube content. What that is yet I'm not sure maybe it'll be movie reactions that seem to be what all the kids are into nowadays. Uh, maybe it'll be um, trailer reactions, maybe it'll be some kind of video essays I'm not sure yet but for now I'm just going to start kind of uploading all my old podcast episodes uh, and uh, this is kind of the introduction to the latest one The Last Picture Show which I recorded with my buddy Mark Espinoza it was recorded on January 28th of this year, 2021, and we released it about uh, two weeks ago, May, last uh, first week of May, more or less. So uh, I hope you enjoy The Last Picture Show. Thank you. Welcome back to the Essential Films Podcast, a podcast devoted to the discussion of the greatest movies ever made or the essential films. I'm Adolfo Costa, and I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Mark Espinoza. On today's episode, we will be discussing the last picture show. We had a little bit of some crazy coincidence today. January 27th, very sad news we got uh, that Cloris Leachman has passed away at age 94. Looks like due to natural causes, but... Obviously, Cloris Leachman, uh, a big part of The Last Picture Show, so it's kind of crazy that the day we're recording this, this news came out. One of those kind of creepy coincidences. Yeah, I remember seeing that uh, I got the news. I think the first one that I saw was TMZ. Now, obviously, I don't put a lot of credence in TMZ, but usually when it comes to these uh, like celebrity deaths, like they're usually one of the first to start reporting. So when I see them, I, you know, oh, the deadline reported, the, these other more reputable sources report, and they did. So that's when I sent you the text, like, you know, that she passed away. And it's just, it's crazy. We were getting ready to do our show today. I even put on my uh, on my status say, like, you know, I'm getting ready to say all these nice things about Cloris Leesman when talking about the last picture show. And then, sadly enough, she passed away today. It, she, I mean, obviously uh, had a big, very long career. I think she started, like, the Mary Tyler Moore show. She's been in lots of big movies, obviously, including... Uh, last Picture Show, also very funny in Young Frankenstein. She was in Butch Cassidy. She was in yeah. Bad Santa in a very funny role. I'm trying to think what else she's been in. History of the World she pops up in. Just, you know, oh, wasn't she Granny in the Beverly Hillbillies movie? Correct. Yeah. I mean, those are off the top of my head. Uh, I don't know what else you may have seen her in, but she had a very long career, lasted, you know, 60-some years or something like that. So, you know, by all accounts, a really cool lady. But yeah, that's kind of crazy. I mean, obviously, I know her person. I mean, not personally, but I know her most from obviously the last picture show. This, I think, this was the first movie I saw her in because, as we'll talk about later when we get into the movie itself, I first saw this movie because I purchased that big uh, America Lost and Found set from uh, Criterion, and this was part of the set, uh, the BBS story. So, this was the first thing I really saw her in. I mean, I may have seen her in things when I was younger, and I, was, I couldn't really appreciate who this was and why I should care about Cloris Leachman. But when I, uh, as far as like being able to see like what she, her talent and what she was all about, it was first the Last Picture Show, and then I saw Kiss Me Deadly, Butch Cassidy. I oh, started getting to deadly, see her in yeah. more things. I be I began to start seeing her in more things like History of the World. Uh, like you say, Young Frankenstein, you mentioned that one. But I did not see Texasville, the sequel to The Last Picture Show. But uh, yeah, in fact, we'll I didn't know there was a that. sequel for, like, years. <laughs> like, yeah. It was very under the radar. Well, we'll, we'll talk. I, I got some notes on that one. Yeah. But what I found out uh, today, and I just discovered this today. I can't believe I didn't know this. She was the voice of the old woman in Beavis and Butthead, Do America, the one on the bus that, that they're always running into. That was her voice. Oh, that, that, that was her? That was her. <laughs> Wow. I mean, clearly she <laughs> had a very uh, varied career, you know? That's awesome. It's awesome. And, and more recently, um, 
you know, obviously, uh, she was in that episode of The Office with Jack Black, where they were in that fake movie that Andy was watching. I don't know if you remember that episode. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Wow. Totally forgot about that one. And she was wasn't she on like a Fox show, like a t- like a sitcom for a few years? Oh, what was it called? She was like a like the goofy grandma on that show, and I don't remember what the show was called. Someone. Will correct me and like later, but it was just looking at her TV credits. Like it could be anything on here. You know, it's just uh, like I mean, she's done. She's been on The Simpsons. She was Mrs. Glick in The Simpsons. She's been on Family Guy. She's been on Two and a Half Men. She's been obviously, like I just said, The Office. Um, she's been. Uh, she's done the voice for Bob's Burgers. Like she's she's done it all, man. Oh, Raising Hope. That's that's the show. She Raising was, Hope. Uh, I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, she was on that show. Yeah, just a crazy long career um, and just a great, you know, a great actress, especially here. I mean, this is probably her finest work, right? Great actress. It's a, it's a sad that, uh, I mean, 94, it's a good, that's a good long life, you know? Can't complain yeah, about good. 94. From what it said uh, in her, I mean, you never know what, how, when you get news of these things, but it says died of natural causes, probably just, you know, she's old, you know, so... Uh, she was an old lady, and natural causes seems about right. Doesn't sound like it was a anything painful or cancer or anything crazy like that. Just you know, old age. You know, I'm going through her TV credits still. Also, she was on an episode of Wonder Woman in 1975. Oh, crazy! She also did the Love Boat. She was on the Muppet Show. Holy crap! Like she, she yeah, she really Muppet has done it all. Movie. Yeah, yeah, she, she was. She was on the Muppet, Muppet movie, movie. The secretary, I think, right? Yes, yes. She, she, um, who's who's allergic to the Muppets, uh, before they go in to see uh, Orson Welles. That's right. Uh, that's a good movie. Uh, yeah. Wow, man, she did everything. I think she was in. Um, looking here, also, she looks like she was a voice in the Crudes, that movie, The Crudes. I don't know if yeah, uh, if it's any. I think I saw it, but I don't remember anything about it. So it was cavemen or something. But yeah, she, I mean, she's still making stuff up until, you know, recently. So yeah, that's long and storied career. I mean, we'll talk about her more, especially like, like you just said, her most probably iconic performance here uh, in the yeah. last picture show, which got her the Academy Award. So, but yeah, but rest in peace, Cloris Leachman. I mean, she, like you said, she had a long, good life, it seems. You know, 94 is a good age. Uh, to go, if, if any, and uh, I mean, she's left behind quite quite the resume. All right, so let's get into the last picture show. You know, you kind of went to already what uh, what you how you discovered the film. Um, I saw the film probably uh, probably like ten years ago or so. You know, it was one of those checking off greatest movies ever made list kind of things. Um, and I watched it, I rented it. And here's the thing. I liked it, but I wasn't like crazy about it when I first saw it. This was like, like I said, like 10 years ago or so. And I probably, I don't think I've seen it since other than like clips watching it this time after a second. And sometimes it happens, but it takes like a second viewing or a third viewing to like really for it to sink in. But it finally sunk in like this movie. And it really, this movie really, made me made me think it made me feel something and it didn't the first time i don't know why it didn't it didn't nothing happened the first time but this time i was i was completely feeling it i mean for me personally it's just it was a little bit i remember the first viewing it was a it took a little bit for me to like get invested again i don't know why maybe i mean you obviously had like a similar situation but you from what you just told me like the the entire first viewing like you really didn't get anything for me about halfway through is when i started like getting really invested i don't know why it it, it kind of started slow for me but uh once you get to a certain point i think and i'll point that out once as we go through the movie once we get to a certain point i don't know what it is like everything just like clicked and i was just like fully into it and it i really felt it more this recent viewing you know to get ready for the show that this is really this is an, a roller coaster, man, of emotions. Just the acting here is just so tremendous. Like without the the main four or five characters here, you know, without each of them like clicking and doing, getting the right beats and everything, like the whole story, the whole dramatic undertone, the whole reason we're supposed to care just falls apart. So it's just a testament to the acting here that it's able to just take what could you know, very well be a mundane story and just kind of rise it up into, you know, something spectacular. Don't tell me yet, because I had a similar experience where it was at a specific point in the movie 
is whenever I got finally got like emotionally invested. And I wonder if it's the same scene for you, but we'll we'll, we'll see you when we get there. Yeah. Uh, Cuz this will be interesting. So, The Last Picture Show, we'll get into some stats here. Okay, so The Last Picture Show was directed by Peter Bogdanovich, uh produced by Stephen Friedman with a screenplay by Larry McMurtry and Bogdanovich based on McMurtry's uh, own book called The Last Picture Show. It stars Timothy Bottoms, a very very young Jeff Bridges, Ellen Burstyn, Ben Johnson, Cloris Leachman, and of course Sybil Shepherd, the movie that made her a star. Uh, cinematography, the beautiful cinematography by Robert Surtees, uh, was distributed by Columbia Pictures on October 22nd, 1971. Let's get into it. I've got some uh, pre-production notes here before we kind of get into the plot. But yeah, just to kind of go back to what I was saying before, it was kind of a revelation this time. I were the first time I saw it, I was like, yeah, it was pretty. It was good. I don't know if it's one of the greatest movies ever made, but it was pretty good. Whereas this time, I was like, oh yeah, I get it. I totally get it now. Maybe I just wasn't in the right age or t- like frame of mind back in back in uh, when I saw it. But now maybe with the experience of uh, ripe old age of 40 <laughs> watching the movie now, I'm just like, oh, I, I get it. I understand it. I get it now. Well, what, what, what's funny about me when I finally got around to this, you know, I think that that um, that America lost and found it is like what? At nine years old at this. I think it came out in 2012. Yeah. That's when I just, I purchased it. If I remember correctly, this was the last film on the set that I watched because I just kept putting it off because just off of the title, it wasn't really interesting me. Like, obviously, in that set, you have iconic stuff like Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, King of Marvin Gardens. Like, there's great stuff in there. I mean, the whole set is great. I mean, you have Head, you have Drive, he said. Like, there's some good stuff. But for some reason, because I had never heard of the, of the last picture show before, like I had just like just off the title, I was just eh, I'll just push it back, push it back, and I'd watch everything else in front of it. But when I finally got around to it, I said to myself, "Why did I wait so long to watch this?" <laughs> so Bogdanovich uh, kind of tells a story about the about how he kind of became involved with this film. He, at the time before this, he had only made two movies. He he had made Targets. Uh, with Boris Karloff, which is a really kind of great B-movie. You should go out of your way to watch it. Um, And he did a Roger Corman movie. I guess actually Target was also a Roger Corman movie, but uh, he did a more typical Roger Corman movie called uh, Planet of the Prehistoric Women. Um, (laughs) And so he only had these two movies to his credit, um, but he was looking to make uh, another film. Uh, And he, he tells the story that where he kind of ran into this book a couple of times. The first time, uh, the actor Sal Minio, uh, who was friends with Peter Bogdanovich, gave him a copy of the book and told him that, you know, he should make a movie about it. And Bogdanovich didn't read it. <laughs> Another time, uh, he saw the book in a bookstore, or sorry, in like a checkout line or something, like the paperback. And again, he, he thought to himself, maybe I could read it. And he looked at the back of the description and it said, a teenager's growing up in Texas. And he was like, ah, I don't want to watch that. Or I don't want to make that movie. <laughs> so, so he didn't make it. And then finally he kind of came into his life one more time. And uh, he gave it to his uh, wife at the time, Polly Platt. And there's a lot of behind the scenes drama with her and, and Sybil Shepherd. We'll get into a little later, but with Polly Platt, who was uh, his kind of collaborator, she was kind of a designer on his movie. She did the costume design and art design in this film. She read the book and basically said, it's a great book, but I don't know how you're going to make it into a movie. And that when he was told that it kind of, and he read the book and he also thought the same thing, but it also kind of intrigued him to try and make the movie anyway. Yeah, like it was one of those things where he would just keep running into this book every so often, right? Like you said, he saw it at the drugstore, Salminio handed it to him, and then finally his wife finally got her hands on it. And, you know, she told him, like, basically, you know, I don't know how you make this into a movie. But it's a good, a damn good book. You know, eventually, like, he kind of just finally saw what everybody else was seeing in it. Yeah, so, you know, he eventually got the funding to to make the film. And uh, he actually collaborated with McMurtry on the on the screenplay. And the what's interesting on this is that the film is actually not shot on any in any studios. It's all on location. Mm-hmm. And the in the film, the small town that they're in is called Anna Reen. But in real life, that 
town is a real place and it's called Archer City. And when on one of the Blu-ray releases, uh, sorry, one of the Blu-ray special features that I saw on this, there was a kind of a story that Bogdanovich tells where he and Polly and Larry McMurtry went to went location scouting for to different towns, like small towns, to see like which would be what would be a good place to to go film. And Larry kept saying, oh, we should look at my town. It's kind of like what we're looking for. <laughs> McDonald's is like, yeah, 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 we'll get to it. And eventually they finally went to Larry McMurtry's town and then they were like, oh, this is exactly what we want. So kind of <laughs> it's interesting that Larry McMurtry, when he wrote the book, kind of based the book town, uh, which was different in the book. I forget what it was called in the book, but it wasn't Archer City. You know, he based the town in that book on his real life hometown. And then when it comes down to make the movie, they film in his real life hometown. I mean, you want to call it coincidence or whatever, but I mean, that's just like everything comes full circle, you know? Yeah, it's one. It's just one of those things that just really worked out well. You know, I do want to before we move on, because we we have been talking about Polly Platt a little bit. She will come up later in a somewhat infamous story regarding this movie but the reason why i always remember polly platt is and you know i have to get this in so if you uh follow polly platt's career she has uh, after this obviously she worked extensively with a man named james l brooks right she was actually the executive vice president of his production company gracie films of i think from the mid 80s until the i think 94 95 around around that time right she was the one that gave james l brooks matt Groening's nine panel life in hell cartoon which i think i forgot what the title was but she handed him one of matt Groening's cartoons and suggested that the two of them meet and it was through that meeting that we got the simpsons so I think Polly Platt is the person that without her, we probably wouldn't have had The Simpsons. So that's why I'll always be in her debt. Hey, look at that. Polly Platt uh, making sure that you got to see Homer Simpson, you know, how many years later. <laughs> and making sure I drop a Simpsons reference every time on the show. At least yep, once. Every time. Every time. I don't think we've had a show where you haven't. Now, right. is there any Simpsons parodies uh, that like jokes or parodies scenes that from this movie? Not that I can remember, and I actually did try to, when I was watching the movie again, I was trying to see if there was something here I could trace back to The Simpsons, and off the top of my head, I couldn't. Now, somebody out there might be screaming at at, at the uh, at their phone right now, like, you know, it's this episode when he did this, and that, well, I don't remember. So, if somebody uh, wants to educate me on that, feel free, and I'm probably just gonna, it's one probably one of those things that I've seen, but then I just, I don't remember. And once somebody mentions it, I'll be like, oh yeah, it was that, but... Off the top of my head right now, I can't really think of anything. Uh, I mean, it didn't spark anything in me, but you are the Simpsons expert. Uh, but it, it didn't spark any kind of Simpsons-esque memories in me. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think still think that my favorite Simpsons parody moment of all time is the one is the episode where Lisa becomes friends with the 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 kid of the gangster. And uh, yes. was it Fat Tony's kid? Is it Fat Tony's kid? Uh, yes, it's Fat Tony. Yeah. And then the very end of the episode, like she's leaving his room, they close the door on her, like the, the Godfather on. <laughs> on That's uh, right. It's one of the newer space. seasons, but yeah, I remember that episode. I did watch it. I That's a good that one. Was, that was my, that was the funniest thing. That was the funniest one I think I've seen. But anyway, yes, um, no, no Simpsons references uh, from the last picture show, unfortunately. I've got some other notes, but I think they would work better as we discuss the movie. But one thing I do want to say is about the casting. Ben Johnson, who did get an Academy Award for this film, he when he was contacted by Bogdanovich, he didn't really want to do it for two major reasons. One, he didn't like the all the swear words uh he had basically i mean if you didn't know ben johnson made a lot was you know an actor in the you know previous decades making a lot of cowboy films john ford and and, and the like probably wasn't really saying a lot of dirty words in those kind of movies uh obviously in 1971 things had changed so he didn't like that and he didn't like the fact that he had too many lines to say which is funny because other than kind of a big speech he has there's he's pretty much a very short sentence kind of character. He doesn't say a whole lot. But uh yeah, he just gave the excuse. He has too many words to memorize. I think Bogdanovich <laughs> ended up like having to get John Ford to convince him to do it. Right. Because I think he had worked for John Ford. I forgot as what 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 his role was, but I know he had worked with Ford before on his on 
few of his, I don't know if it's one of his films or a few of his films. So, because Ford was a mentor to him, like him, like he looked up to guys like him, Howard Hawks, like those were his heroes, right? So obviously he knew John Ford. I think he had to tell him, like, listen, can you convince Ben to do this movie for me? And I think, I don't know if uh, Bogdanovich or Ford was the one that told him, listen, if you do this movie, you're going to get an Academy Award. Somebody was, said that to him. I can't remember it was, it was Bogdan- which one. Bogdanovich said it to to to, to Ben Johnson. Yeah, right. Yeah, and he was right. Um, but to your point about the um, about his relationship with John Ford, I at the time, kind of around the same time that he was, you know, he's starting to kind of cut his teeth under Roger Corman. He was also this guy that just went around interviewing directors and like just putting together books and things like that about these interviews. So you may have known him from doing that, of doing these interviews with John Ford. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, that that's, um, it's funny that, you know, he told him you're going to win that. Cause the reason I think I remember it's Bogdanovich is because I think he's telling him a story. He tells the story on, on one of the criterion features. I can't remember which one where he was, where he basically said, I convinced him to do it by eventually saying that he's going to win an Academy Award. And I said, I didn't know if that was going to happen or not, but it got him through the picture, and he won anyway. So <laughs> Yeah, there you go. As we uh, as we start the last picture show, we kind of get some kind of scenes of this uh, very dusty Texas town, very windy right now, very desolate town. Archer City is what it's called. Uh, and what again, what's just kind of interesting is that this was a real town that they were shooting in and this was well, remember stuff. well remember that's the shoot name archer city in the movie it's called anarene yeah. texas that's right i'm sorry anarene texas yeah you just kind of get kind of these, this glimpse of you get this really cool like pan shot of just basically looking across this what seems like downtown and there's just nobody there it's completely desolate this is when we're introduced to our uh, main character sunny played by timothy bottoms and sunny is friends with uh, this kid who's they never really he's not i don't think he's necessarily well, i don't know what the right term is cuz i don't want to offend anybody but i think he's mentally challenged um right. and he's uh he might be i don't think he's deaf but he doesn't talk he's a mute right so he he doesn't talk and he's mentally challenged his name is billy and he just, this kid that kind of, he's, at first, here's the thing, I always got confused about this, I had to look it up to figure out what the relationship was, was that he kind of hangs out with Sam the Lion, who owns a local pool hall and the local movie theater, um, but he lives with Bill, uh, Sam the Lion, and he's not, it's not his dad, it's like, he just kind of looks after him. Because right. like, I don't know what happened to his parents, but they don't because I don't think they ever say in the movie. But he just looks after him, and he's just kind of his little buddy, and he's friends with Sonny, and they you know hang out in a pool hall. Yeah, the lack of parents in this movie is very uh, very concerning <laughs> on the surface, right? But um, but yeah, um, so you have Sonny, Billy, and then um, Sonny's best friend Dwayne, who's played by Jeff Bridges. Like they, they kind of they're best friends. They kind of hang out at this pool hall at the time that's owned by Sam. And when they're not in the pool hall, they're also in the diner that Sam owns. Or when they're not doing that, they're also at the movie theater that Sam owns. So, um, yeah, I mean, in a small town like this, there's really not that much to do. So it it seems like, you know, Sam pretty has a a good hold as far as, like, ownership of, like, pretty much all the the hot spots, the three hot spots of the town. (laughs) Exactly. The the hot spots of Anarene. (laughs) But, yeah, so we're in, in this scene, we're introduced to Sam. Uh, we're introduced to Sonny and we're stu- introduced to Billy. And we're also introduced to a kind of uh, minor character named Abilene, um, who we find out a little bit more about later. But what's interesting on like a rewatch, knowing who Abilene is, who he's kind of seeing, having an affair with, and how that relates to Sam, there's this kind of sh- like stare down that they have at the beginning of the movie when he comes in to like uh, play pool. That's just kind of like, oh, now that I know that information. That's a very interesting kind of exchange between the two actors. Because first viewing, that makes no sense. Like, it's just, you know, you and, don't understand why it's happening. And they don't really dwell on it, really. They don't really yeah. dwell on it. It's just kind of like this shot. You're just like, you just see him, like, looking over at him, and you're like, huh. Now that when you have the context, it's much more interesting. Like, oh, there's something more sinister going on here, and I like it. <laughs> we also get introduced to uh, Dwayne, who is uh, Sonny's kind of best buddy. He looks like he works, you know, in, like, the oil fields or something during the night. Hangs out with Dwayne as he gets dropped off by his co-workers. But, yeah, back to your point, there doesn't seem to be any parents. Uh, apparently there's a line, and I guess I missed it, where where um, the waitress, uh, Genevieve, right? That's her name? Uh, right. She She... 
says to Sonny, like, oh, it's interesting that you two boys got that place together and you guys don't live with your parents anymore or something. There's a they, they, they mention something about the fact that they do not live with their parents. Right. Um, but I don't, I never, I didn't, I don't know. I don't know when it was and I didn't catch it, but yeah, they don't live with their parents. You never see that. You do see Sonny's dad for like a minute, maybe even 30 seconds. And that's it. Like he's not, their parents are not important at all in the film, which probably you could probably have some, you know, thematic. There's some, what am I trying to say? There's definitely, whenever you know that information and see how Sonny relates to some of the older people in his life, it, it kind of makes that a little more interesting. Exactly. Like, again, it, it's obviously this, as we get through, like, we'll, we'll kind of round round it out a little better, but obviously this is the story, as we're going to find out, of, of, I mean, Sonny's like the main, main character, but Dwayne is like pretty much, I don't want to say he's like a side character because he's also like a main character, but I, I feel like the film focuses more on Sonny, and I mean, this is a coming-of-age film, so we kind of like, focus on like what's the best way to say it basically how Sonny and Dwayne kind of start out here is very different from how we end up at the end of the film when we get there so that journey of in between is really what the meat and potatoes of this movie is and none of that involves either of their parents so I guess it makes sense so uh, we kind of cut to the scene where Sonny is uh going to the the picture show as it were he's going to see his his I think it's his girlfriend uh yes, at the is. time but he he uh, goes in to see his girlfriend, and they kind of sit there for like a couple minutes. The movie they're watching is Father of the Bride with Spencer right. Tracy and uh, Elizabeth Taylor. The bank. So, yes. which to me was like, okay, so this puts this movie around 1950, 1951. So, right. that's where I'm where it takes place, I guess. So, anyway, basically they decide to to kind of skip the movie after a couple minutes and um, have a little teenage fun. Yeah, I think they said it starts I think it starts mid nineteen fifty one and it ends in nineteen fifty two. I forget what time period it is though. Like what like what's what season, but I know it's it ends starts in fifty one and it ends in fifty two. Yeah, something like that. Oh, but if I did skip ahead so before we see before we see them go out into the woods for you know to neck each other, um they Dwayne's girlfriend comes in in this kind of the same seat, seats where they are and it's the, our first introduction to JC, um, and uh, played by Sybil Shepherd. Who, Shepherd, yep. I mean, it, it, her introduction, her scene, like where it kind of just kind of closes in on her as she says, "You know, what are you guys doing back here in the dark?" Um, very, I don't know. I wouldn't say iconic, but it's a very certainly a beautiful debut shot for Sybil Shepherd. I agree. Um... And before we get into her a little bit, because I do want to kind of talk about a little bit of her background uh, before moving forward, but I do want to point out something funny in the fact that those, t uh, Sonny and Dwayne, I love how, like, apparently the pickup truck, they share it. Like, I guess they must have, like, maybe each paid half for the uh, for the truck. And yeah, they, they have, it. like, that, they have that schedule as to, like, you know, when, you know, each can, can get it, and it seems like Dwayne always gets it on Saturdays, which is always the best time to have a car, especially when you're a teenager. So, and you can tell, like, you know, it's driving, like, Sunny nuts. You can see, like, his, like, Timothy Bottoms has that, like, that great facial expression. Like, you know, well, you always get it on Saturdays, so I always have to go to the picture show if I want to make out with my girlfriend, you know? So, it's just, I, I just love that kind of chemistry that they have between the, between the two, and that, that whole arrangement. Obviously, like, he was getting the short end of the stick on that arrangement, so, but... Obviously, like he kind of just like passively took it, and so you know there's already there's you kind of tell there's already a little bit of a, of tension there. I mean, it's something so it's it's petty when you look back on it, but there's the beginning of something there that's gonna kind of blow over way later on. But you kind of see like the beginnings of some you know something's wrong there, right? Yeah, it, it's it's certainly a relationship where where Dwayne, played by Jeff Bridges, is more dominant, more assertive to the to to Sonny's kind of more passive. And like you said, that kind of blows up later. But yeah, like, yeah, definitely you start to see that relationship start here. You understand how that relationship starts here. Now, when it comes to Sybil Shepherd, now remember she got she got the uh oh what's what's the day the debut credit that everybody gets? It's like um and introducing, right? So remember in the credits is and introducing Sybil Shepherd, right? So this is 
like like we said earlier, this was her big break. Now, the story goes that Bogdanovich saw her on the cover of Glamour. I forget what year it was. And he arranged to meet her uh, in New York. I guess like, they were both there at the same time. You know, he contacted her agent. Like, you know, I want I want to meet her. I saw her in a magazine. She, she could be perfect for my movie. And he said there was something about, I think, has something to do with, there was, I think, a flower or something on the table yes. that they were sitting at. And the way she was... I guess handling like she was holding the flower in her hand just seeing how she handled herself there with just with that flower in her hand was like I found my JC she's right there she didn't have to do like any lines or anything yeah basically because the the way he put it basically that she was picking off the flower petals and he's like that's how she treats her men and it's that's kind it. of yep. yeah uh and that's <laughs> would prove pretty much true. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it was like a star-making performance, a star-making role for her. Obviously, she became a big actress, you know, later on. But, yeah, the, and then, I don't know when really to introduce this, but, like, may as well be now. Very famously on this film, uh, Bogdanovich was married to Polly Platt, who was doing the costume and the art design, fell in love with Sybil Shepard, and the two started having an affair during the filming of the movie while Polly Platt was still serving as the designer. So, you know, there's a lot of stories about how awkward this was for like the crew and the cast and everybody, you know, but, you know, cause they're one, they're friends with, you know, Bogdanovich. They're also friends with Polly and then they're friends with Sybil, but then then realize that there's an affair going on. And it's, I mean, that's such a horrible like position to be in, you know? And then like, yeah. you have to see all these people act and act together. Polly Platt still doing her hair and makeup, which is interesting. And <laughs> even after the facts, <laughs> So I mean that's a that's, she's uh, a I mean you gotta you gotta stay professional you know yeah yeah I, that's I couldn't even I don't know if I could I can't even imagine I don't know if I was Sybil Shepherd and this woman was had you know instruments near my eyes I don't think I would allow her to to be there on the on the Criterion edition of Last Picture Show there are two documentaries I only watched one of them I've been meaning to watch the second one which is the more recent one I think from '99 but. I saw the first one, I think it was from 1990, which they made while they were filming Texasville. And I think it was Larry McMurdy's mother they interviewed on that, right? I don't know if you saw that one. Did you watch the... the yeah, I saw that one. one, yes. Yeah, that's a good one. And she tells a story where this was already after all this stuff had gone on with, you know, Bogdanovich, Sybil Shepherd, and then with, with his wife, right? So... I think it was Larry McBurdy's mom who tells the story that she wanted to take a picture of them together, right? And it's that it, that's the picture that's kind of floating around when it comes to like from the behind the scenes. That's like the, the I guess the most famous picture. Bogdanovich and Polly Platt. Like, you know, oh, you know, you guys let's take a picture or whatever, however she she says it, right? So she had a hard time taking their picture because they didn't want to get near each other. Like there was always this huge space, like this social distancing space, right? <laughs> Between them. And, you know, she's like, well, get closer, get closer, get closer. And finally, like, they got as close as they were going to get. She just took the picture anyway. And that's the picture now that, like, of the two of them, that's after, you know, he already started having that affair with Sybil Shepherd. And you could just, like, you, you couldn't tell in their faces. Like, they both have smiles. Like, obviously, like, there's you could see the distance between the two of them. But, like, their smiles, the, the, the faces they're making, like, they're going on as if, like, everything's normal. But it's just such a awkward position to be in you know and just i think when she told that story about that picture like it just like even i felt the awkwardness you know it's just it's it's, it's just a terrible position to be in yeah i <laughs> it's just there's just nothing about that situation that seems fun at all but yeah that that documentary is really good uh because it basically so it's like you said it's during the making of texas phil so like the cast has been reunited, so they have opportunities to talk to Peter Bogdanovich and Sybil Shepherd and stuff because they have access to them. And and the Polly Platt, I think, was interviewed with too. Um, but she, but yeah, you you have all this access to every everybody, and it also talks to people from the town and how they reacted to the movie that was basically their town. Um, yeah. and a lot of them were like, "Oh, that's a bunch of crap," or some of them were <laughs> were like, "I think I was uh, JC. I think that you know." <laughs> and, uh, but but, sure but yeah, it's it, it's very it's a very um it's a very good documentary. It's only like thirty minutes or forty minutes or something, but it's it's just very uh, just very interesting to see them all kind of 
you know, react that way. I, not to go on a tangent, but I think my favorite story from that documentary was when they inter- interviewed uh, Timothy Bottoms and he talked about how he had a crush on Sybil Shepherd. He never told her or whatever the story was. And then, like, I, I think, like, the, the guy, the director, like, actually, like, went up and told her that, like, uh, he had a he had a crush on her and, like, she, like, surprised him. That's a that's a that's a funny moment because it's real, you know, and I, and I got a pop out of that because you, you could feel it like. <laughs> Because I think she, like she came up to him behind and like you know she's like oh hi because I think he hadn't seen her like since they made last picture show I got a kick out of that yeah that's a that was a great scene in that in that documentary uh, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna uh, blow up the the the, the Criterion edition a little later but that's that's another reason to buy that <laughs> back in the Archer City I'm sorry Air Anarine 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 we have uh, Sunny trying to you know basically make out with his girlfriend and what's so funny about this sequence is there i think i guess he must have had the truck in this scene no, but, uh, yeah it must have yeah so they're in the they're in the truck and it's so funny how like robotic this girl is to the to like starting to make it she's just like very matter of factly taking off her shirt and her bra and she's like <laughs> not even like not trying to be like seductive at all and then like they start making out and sunny just kind of puts her hand on her breast and it's just like i don't know what he's trying to do it's it's very it's very like clumsy there's, there's nothing sexy about this at all yeah it's very it's like he's not like doing and we're not going to get graphic here but he's basically just squeezing it like it's not yeah. anything nothing uh very romantic you know as they're uh, making out you know they get into a little bit of an argument after he tries to put his hand somewhere else she wouldn't let him and then they kind of get into an argument and basically they just kind of break up right then and there charlene Charlene is her name. There you go. Okay. I think the isn't the the gym scene next after this? Is like it when the coach I is making them some... run lap? Oh no! You know what? Before that, they're in they're in like just regular English class or something. We get a little bit more of like JC and I think like in the back, Dwayne kind of makes some that, like smart ass comment. And I think um they focus on Joe Bob. He's the one that like gives the he answers like the the teacher's question about whatever I forgot what the question was, but they focus on him like a lot here like. He's actually like the sole focus of the scene once he starts talking, which is funny because of what happens later. Yeah, it's about a poem, um, and he he basically you know tries to like uh, the teacher tries to ask him interpret it, and he basically ends up being ends up going into you know you just have to lead a good moral life and God you'll be accepted into God's you know heaven or something. Had nothing to do with this that they were talking about, but he's. He's the preacher's kid. I guess he had to throw that in. So there's some other character moments in here which I think are funny is that, uh, one, Dwayne kind of makes a smart-ass comment, and then he kind of looks back at JC to see if he's, she's laughing. She's totally, <laughs> totally right. ignoring it, the whole situation. And then you get JC, uh, shot at JC, and she's basically just, like, looking herself in the mirror and, like, checking her makeup. And then Sonny is basically just kind of looking outside and just see. I think he sees thinks he's two dogs having having a good time with each other, and he's just kind of kind of gazing off into the distance. And so kind of it's kind of a portrait into each one of their personalities, I think. And I think after this we get is the basketball sequence where basically F- oh there is a running joke <laughs> in the in the the first couple like half of the movie where Sonny and Dwayne uh, are on the football team and they're high school seniors. And you know, it, the, oh, every time they run into someone, they're like, "I was like, guys, learn learn how to pass." <laughs> or, or, uh, no, it was, uh, it was uh, you guys got to learn how to tackle, something like that. Oh yeah, I you guys got to learn how to tackle. You guys got to learn how to tackle. <laughs> and and then like, and, he, and then next person would be like, "It'd be better if you tackled someone." And you know, so, <laughs> so you know, it's funny, but it just reminded me because he's you know about to go, uh, you know, he's in the middle of basketball season now, so. You know, after practice, one day the coach goes up to him and he's like, hey, listen, uh, the wife needs to go to the doctor's appointment. I don't want to take her. So uh, why don't you take her and then you can skip basketball practice and you can you can drive my car. And, you know, so he basically gets suckered into taking the coach's wife to the doctor. Yes. So his wife, Ruth Popper, which is played by Cloris Leachman, he picks her up. Takes her to the doctor. You could tell at the beginning because, like, she's disappointed that it's not her husband in a way. Because it's like, because she seems surprised that Sonny's there. Like, oh, oh, I thought he was going to take me or whatever she says, right? So Sonny's taking her to the doctor, waits for her, takes her back home. 
And then um obviously like she's still when we introduced to Ruth Popper, she's very uh she's very reserved, as if like, you know, like it's like she's a... Uh, She's stuck in a shell. She's very repressed. Depressed, repressed, whatever you want to call it, right? When they get back home, like, she invites him, and, like, do you want, you know, can I have something to drink? Like, you know, oh, do you have a Dr. Pepper? So she offers him a Dr. Pepper from the fridge. And then while he's, like, sitting there drinking it, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just starts crying. And he, obviously, he's seen this, and he's freaking out, you know? And I, I forgot what he, what he says, or something about, like, you know, do you, what's wrong? Or I, I think he says something to that effect. And then she goes, you will have no idea, do you? And she just, like, well, she just continues. He was like being upset. <laughs> what it was was he didn't say what's wrong. It's like, well, so he's so yeah, she actually started crying like after she left the doctor's office, but not as much. It was but you're yeah. right, when she gets home, she kind of bursts out into tears. But so but he like has known like this whole time that this lady is like upset about something. Cause he asked her even Carl, was it something bad? Because she just came from the doctor. Um yeah. and they never explain what it is. And when Cloris Leachman asked Bogdanovich about it, like he was he's like just She's like, it, they don't say it. We're going to keep it vague. So she kind of, I don't think she said what she was thinking about, but she's basically just made up her mind and acted about what the kind of news it would be and then acted appropriately. So kind of an interesting way to do it. Now, he, side tangent. When I first saw this movie, I did not pick up about her husband. About Right. And that's... And that, that was very... That's very, uh, very subtly in there. Like, I didn't pick it up the first time. It wasn't until... You know, after I saw it, I kind of just like started reading up on it, and I saw that he's meant to be a closeted homosexual. I'm like, really? I did not catch that. And but then you see when you know that, and you watch it, like, oh wait, it's it's there. I didn't, I just didn't see it. So so yeah, because they portray it as very lonely. Because obviously she's not really, you know, involved romantically with her own husband. But um, but the scene where you said you you don't even know, do you? Is whenever. Sonny, who's been misinterpreting everything this whole time, says, oh, you you must be glad that uh, when basketball season is going to be over. And she's like, why? It's because the coach will be spending more time with you. And then yeah. that's what she breaks down. She says, <laughs> you don't right. even know. But now that you like, when you have the information about him being a, a closet homosexual, it's, you're like, oh, that makes sense. But the thing is, like you said, I still don't, like, I, I watched it again to, you know, looking for that subtext and i didn't i didn't see it i know that from reading up on it and from an interview that cloris leachman gave but i don't i, I don't feel like is there a clue in the movie other than how she acts not really that's that's the thing too like it wasn't until i read it and then i'm kind of seeing like how she's acting now now knowing uh, that's the reason why she's acting the way she is like that's when it makes more sense because other than that like you just i didn't catch any other side because the coach is barely in the movie like he's in like what two scenes like at the beginning and at the end and that's, yeah, that's it so, like how it. can you really like tell you know yeah it i don't know it maybe it's just from the book i, I don't know the difference between the book and the movie so yeah, yeah. i haven't read the book but maybe it's in the book it more ex explicitly stated but it's certainly not explicitly stated in the film um yeah. and i guess it's just all subtext but but yeah, apparently that is why uh, she does not want to. Because you can infer a lot of things from that. She could be, maybe he beats her, or maybe they can't get pregnant, or something, or maybe right. he cheats on her, or whatever. Like you don't really can't really get any information. You just know that she doesn't want to be in a marriage with her husband, and that's it. Like you don't really. I don't feel like they explicitly tell you. But uh, I don't even think Sonny gets, even gets to finish the Dr. Pepper because, like, he kind of just sprints out of there after that whole exchange. But he thanks her yeah. for it, at least. Kind of after this, it's around Christmas time. So it's funny because, like, the movie starts kind of during football season. So you got to think September, October. And all of a sudden, we're at Christmas. There's, like, the, it jumps quickly in time, and you kind of have to catch up to where they are. Um, cause right. The movie takes place over about a year. Um, but there are times where you're like, Oh, okay. This is where we are in the year now. Okay, um, but yeah. So it's around Christmas time. There's like a big Christmas party in, at, at the town, uh, and everyone's going. Like, so you know how small this town is that the whole town is going to this Christmas party. As JC pulls up, she meets up with uh, Randy Quaid's character, who his name is escaping me. Lester, Lester. Lester He's kind bro. of like this. How do you describe Lester? He's kind of like this. Uh, is he a rich kid? Because he like eventually. I think so. Yeah, like he's, he's part of like that affluent crowd. Yeah. Okay, so he's not as okay. So he's a rich kid. Basically, this rich kid who who's, who's kind of has the hots for who has the hots for uh, JC, and it's Randy Quaid, <laughs> who even at 
you know, whatever, 20 years old or whatever he was here, still looks like a huge goof. But he's he basically tells her, hey, w- w- you should uh, come out with us later tonight. Let's go to Bobby. We go to Bobby Sheen's house and, you know, everyone is, has a naked pool party, you know, skinny dipping pool. And she's like, I can't because I'm, I'm with Dwayne, my boyfriend. But talk to me after the dance. Maybe we'll maybe I can work something out, basically. <laughs> Well, at least with uh, with Randy Quaid in this movie at 20 years old, at least at this time, the letter Q didn't mean anything to him like it does now. And we're going to leave it at that. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, JC's like, oh, you know, let me see if I can get away from Dwayne, basically. Like, she doesn't say it like that, but she's like, you know, let me see if I can get away from uh, from this guy. And then I'll I'll meet up with you. We'll go to that pool party, right? Then kind of the focus kind of shifts to uh, to the party itself. I think she starts – she dances with Dwayne, I think, if I remember correctly. And, and who else is there? There's, I mean, the whole town is there, but they focus on – oh, her mom is there, right? Yeah, so she her mom – She dances mo- with uh, – who does she dance with? Okay, um, so here's the thing. So there's this guy – What's his name? Abilene. Yes. And he works for her husband because I think her husband owns like the oil plant or whatever. But she is also his lover. And what happens is he comes in with like his wife and then she kind of comes up to him and like gives him a big kiss in front of his wife. That's and then right. Just, <laughs> so, that, so that's when you like you understand that like basically she's been having basically an open affair with this guy and because you know, no one seems to <laughs> no one right. seems to like do anything about it. Uh, you also get to see um, Sonny interact with his dad. Kind of Again, it's just very short, like, oh, hey, what's going on? You doing okay? Yep. Okay, bye. Kind of one of those kind of conversations. What else happens here? Um, oh, Dwayne and uh, JC, like, kind of go out to the car. Uh, and it must be his night. <laughs> it must be his night to have the car. Uh, and he gives her, like, this really nice watch that, you know, Clearly, he probably ha- must have saved a lot for, right? Like a really nice gold watch. I guess it's gold. I don't know. And they start making out, and she's like, oh, thank you so much. But I got to go to a pool party tonight. I'm sorry. My mother's making me, but, you know, I got to go. Sorry, I'm going to ditch you. <laughs> I mean, I think later on in the movie, doesn't Sonny call him P-whipped over her? Because it, it, he's, I think, doesn't he say that? He doesn't. He actually says it like he says, "pee whipped," right? When they were you say about that? to have their fight. Yeah, he, I think he does say something like that. Yeah, yeah. But no, she, but I mean, is he wrong though? <laughs> like, no. Look, I mean, look, he's look. he's obsessed with her. Oh, and, but but it, 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 this pisses me off later with after what happens to that watch. But we're gonna get to that I in a little bit. But uh, <laughs> so, so I think this is this is clearly when we start to see the manipulative JC, right? Because she uh, she clear she manipulates him by like by telling him like, "Oh, I'm gonna go to this," but then she starts making out with him. And and let she basically lets lets him feel her up in her uh, lady business, um, and that kind of kind of eases the tensions with him, right. so he's not mad at her. And but as and as soon as she realizes that, she kind of goes, "Okay, bye," and takes off. <laughs> yeah, but then even Dwayne, like even still, even though like yeah, he got to I guess what what would we call that second base? <laughs> I guess he yeah, got to I, at least. Depends on how old you are, I guess. It depends on your yeah. generation. <laughs> what what, what yeah. the bases are. So, but then even having rounded second base, as uh, as they said in, on Meet the Parents, bro, he still, he sees Lester and he tries to like fight him because he's taking his girl away. Like, hey, what are you doing? You know, and then the, the old geezers from the party, like try to break it up and just, you know, he's like, uh, you know, you know, why don't you go home? Why don't you go home? You're like, it's, it's, it's too nice a night for this or whatever he says. Yeah. And <laughs> so it, it kind of shows like he took his anger and frustration at her and like basically unloaded it on Lester. <laughs> right. But again, yeah, you see how JC's manipulative first by kind of doing that to, to Dwayne and then she's in the car and he watches as she's watching Dwayne beat up Lester or try to beat up Lester. And then it cuts to her. And you can tell she's just a little bit excited about that. Yeah. She's excited about two guys fighting over her. And after this, we get a kind of a, re- a reunion between Sonny and Ruth. She's kind of, I guess she's one of the people that were organizing the, the party or the dance. And so she's doing some cleanup and uh, he's back there. He says hi and he kind of helps her clean up. She kind of digs into his personal life, asking about if he has any girlfriends or anything like that. You know, he said, no, he broke up. And then they kind of have this nice moment and then they kiss each other. Yeah, they start making out. <laughs> and it's interesting because it's because they're just like by the trash or like taking out the tr- trash or something. So not yeah, 
a romantic spot, but they just like, kind of look at each other and go for it, and it's just a really interesting moment. Yeah, I, which doesn't last very long because obviously cause she stopped. You know, people could be watching, so they kind of just like she kind of just like walks away after that. Yeah, this is the start of something between those two. So our next scene, our next major scene, is JC has arrived at the party. Wouldn't you know it? She walks in, and uh, everybody is absolutely naked. Uh, Bobby Sheen comes up to her. Uh, his all of his uh, virtues out on display. And he's like, "Hey, JC, yeah, you're welcome to be here, but everyone has got to. Everybody knew." has to take off their clothes in front of everybody on the top of the diving board. And, and then all of a sudden you get Randy Quaid's stupid face like in a point of view. It's like, I did it last Easter. <laughs> oh, wacky Randy Quaid. <laughs> you know, she goes up there. She, you know, starts taking off her clothes. She notices a freaking like 12-year-old kid in, in the water and turns out it's like Bobby's little little brother and he's trying to stare at her pervert but yeah everyone's looking at her and she very reluctantly takes off her clothes but as she you know and she eventually gets gets through it all and you know jumps into the water but what she forgot to do was take off the brand new watch that Dwayne had given her and it basically killed like just destroyed the watch killed the watch but then she has that look on her face like oh what are you gonna do yeah and that just really got on my nerves when I saw that the first I'm like, exactly. You because, B word. Because she, Dwayne got that for her as a Christmas gift. Dwayne doesn't have a lot of money, so he had to have saved up for it. She, at this point in her life, probably has no concept of what saving money is because she's a rich girl. She's like a rich kid. Nobody, she doesn't, probably has never known any sort of hardship right so so she doesn't even think about that and then she like you like you said she just kind of shrugs it off like oh well so it, it's not only that she can't even appreciate the gift but it's also that she is so manipulative about it like she didn't even get him a gift. like if you were on the fence about her as a person up to this point it's understandable but now like you know like she's she's a very shady character <laughs> after this yeah she's um not she very basically throughout the rest of the film starts to to get worse. <laughs> yeah. So after um after they go swimming, I might be going out of order here, but just since we're talking about the scene, after they go swimming, uh, I think that's where she has the the talk with Bobby, and she kind of uh kind of comes on to him, but he's like, "You're still a virgin, right?" And she's like, "Yeah." He's like, oh, "I don't sleep with virgins. Come back to me after you leave virginity." <laughs> So JC basically now spends uh, a good part of the film trying to lose her virginity, and we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that a little later. Well, in between, like you know, that the scenes at the pool party, you get the scenes with the with the boys. Like you know, Dwayne is now bored; he has nothing to do, so he and Sonny meet up with these other kids, and then they have the harebrained scheme of trying to get their their friend Billy uh, laid, basically. So that that doesn't yeah. end well. Yeah, so they they take Billy to like the, I guess the town prostitute, um, and uh, you know they she he kind of walks into like the this car where she's been waiting for him, uh, and as he starts to get his business going, he ends a little prematurely, which angers the uh, the prostitute, and she hits him in the face <laughs> and knocks him out of the car. <laughs> Uh, that, that that poor Billy. Um, so Billy has a bloody nose, and uh, they take him home to to Sam's pool shop. Billy is a little upset, obviously, and uh, Sam sees that he has a bloody nose and tells him to go inside. And the boys kind of admit that, yeah, we took him to see a hooker, and uh, she uh, she kind of beat him up. But at first, like. He thought they were just all like fooling around with each other, and then when they actually told him the story, that's uh, it made it even worse. Yeah, and uh, you know, I he, he has such a good uh, good little uh, few lines here where he basically says, you know, I don't want none of your business anymore. Like, I, you know, when I hear none of your business, I don't want anything to do with your business. You know, so in the end, he basically bans all these kids from. Everything he owns from the pool shop, from the restaurant or the diner, I should say, and from the from the movie theater, they're all banned now. <laughs> and yeah. then, except I, and I love. Wayne. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. You say it. Except Wayne, who like kind of hid in the back seat, so he never saw him. So uh, he kind of got off, got off scot free. Yep. Even though, like, he you could argue he was probably one of the ones that like 
came up with the idea. He got to uh, kind of weasel his way out of the consequences. Exactly. Um, but yeah, he, uh, he basically tells him, you know, the the one that uh, the the thing that he told uh, Sonny that really made him upset and made him feel guilty was you didn't even have the decency to wash his face. And exactly. Then Sonny feels so guilty about that, and uh, he really takes it to heart, you know. And this is kind of where we were starting to see like the father and son relationship with Sonny and and uh, Sam, even though they're not fought biologically father and son. He's you know, he's clearly looking for a father figure and he's disappointed when Sam is disappointed in him. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously like, like you said, this is the beginning of where you see like there, there is a deep connection between these two where like Sonny really takes to heart, like everything that Sam says. And like, I think he was the one, you know, most crushed by, you know, Sam banning him from, from his establishments, but that gets built upon later. There's a great scene, really a great scene. I think it was the singular scene that got the Oscar for Ben Johnson. Right. So yeah. we'll get to that later. In our next scene, we see Sonny and Ruth started to have a little bit of a, 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 an affair. This is the beginning of it. After their kiss, they go to Ruth's house while the coach is at school. They get into the room and it's a very awkward, a very awkward moment as they're trying to be sexy and <laughs> romantic and they clearly <laughs> don't know how. Probably because A, Ruth has never received it from her husband and B, because Sonny is um, a kid with not much experience. <laughs> you know, they even like, it's funny because she's, she's ta- I, I, I don't know if it, it was a intended, I don't know if Timothy Bottoms intended this or if it was an accident and ended up looking good. But like as they kind of walk into the bedroom before they've undressed and anything, she's talking to him and there's a pause in where she talks and he goes in to kiss her for like a half second. And then she continues talking and then he pulls away. And and then at the end of that, <laughs> that that's whenever they kiss. So I wonder if like he thought that his the line was over and then he went to, you know, and then he went to kiss her and then realized that she was still talking. <laughs> I, I don't know if, if that was intended or if it was just a happy accident, but either way, it just kind of added a little bit of kind of humor to me and, and uh, to, to the awkwardness of this kid doesn't know when he's supposed to, you know, go in for the kiss. I mean, not just humor, added realism to the, to the scene too. Uh, it, it makes it that much more authentic. Like, you know, here's this, like, you know, this dumb kid, <laughs> like you just say, he doesn't know what he's doing. So like, he's, you know, not reading her properly. So he's like going in for a kiss when he's, she's still talking. It's just, it, it, it just, it made it more real. As they're getting into bed, it's funny. Cause they still have, you know, their underwear on and she has her bra and underwear on and they went into bed and you know they were not neither actor was basically comfortable with actually being naked so when they went into the bed in their underwear they had under the sheets extra underwear that once they got underneath they were kind of mime taking it off and then grab the extra pair and throw it out <laughs> what's funny is that when the on the first take Cloris Leachman started she got so into the moment and the character that when she got into the bed, she actually took off her bra and underwear, and they had to redo the scene. <laughs> that yeah, that <laughs> that's that's certainly uh that's an interesting story. They have they have sex, and it is a very awkward experience. Mm. And it makes me wonder: is it supposed to? And because it's so awkward for her, as she starts crying, is that supposed to imply that she's actually at this age she was still a virgin? That's a good question. You know, I did not pick up on that, but that could very well be it. I mean, obviously, this from this first, obviously, the first time is always going to be awkward between these two, right? So, I mean, what I picked up on it was because as the affair keeps going, like you see like Ruth kind of just start blossoming. Like she starts getting more comfortable. Like she's more casual, but we'll get to that. Like as we progress, but like here, obviously this is the beginning where like, it's the first time and a very awkward and quick first time. So, but I didn't catch if there's subtext that she's still a virgin, like she very well could be. Um, So that's a good catch there. But the way I always saw it was just, Oh, it's just, it's their first time. It's I mean, between it's just awkward. You know, that's just how it, how it ended up being. And it, that could be it too, and the, and her crying could also just be from emotional, from just being with a with a man in, in such a long time, and that it makes her emotional, and it makes one her escape her life, and you know. But it it could just be that. But I I kind of just had that thought as I as the scene progressed. But basically afterwards they 
you know, have a, a tender moment and you can see that they actually, it's, this is less of an, uh, like a sexual thing and more emotional because they seem to care about each other. And uh, we'll see more of that relationship as the film goes on. We next get a scene of Sonny in, in the diner, which he's not supposed to be in, but Genevieve kind of takes pity on him and gives him some eggs or like an egg sandwich or something. <laughs> he's not supposed to be there. And then suddenly Sam the Lion comes in with Billy. Sonny decides maybe he should just get up and go. But Sam basically says he should really finish your food or something like that. So he sits yeah. down. And you kind of just get the feeling, oh, Sam forgave him. Yeah, and then they start talking. I mean, I think the first thing he even mentions, like, after, like, because I think, I forget what Sam says, but he basically forgives Sonny. Billy still has that attachment to him. And, and funny, in real life, like, that's, you know, Timothy Bottom's brother, <laughs> by the way. Yes. I don't think we mentioned that yet. Yes. So, but Billy has this attachment to, to Sonny, right, that, that Sam sees. And even, you know, after, like, this whole, you know, messy incident or whatever you want to call it, like, you know, Billy still kind of looks up to Sonny and, you know, Sam realizes this, and, you know, obviously Sonny's very remorseful, you know, I'm so sorry about this, you know, so obviously Sam can tell that Sonny means it, so it's like, yeah, you know, it, it's fine. And then, like, I think they start talking about just, like, sports, <laughs> like, just kind of make conversation, again. like, he's like, about the basketball season, like, I think the last game, like, they lost, like, 121 to 14 or some comment he made, which is funny, because, again, it's going back to the whole football thing, like, you know, I guess the the, the kids in this town, they just, they suck at sports. Yeah, it's a running gag throughout the, throughout the, the film. We get another scene with Ruth and and uh, Sonny after a, oh, I'm assuming it was another romantic session, and she's just kind of sitting there very lovingly, like brushing his hair, and they're talking about how, you know, why didn't you leave your husband? Why, didn't you have, why haven't you left coach after all this time? She's like, well, I was 20 years old and I uh, was, I had to get married to somebody, and uh, I was never, I was raised not to, not to get divorced you know so so basically i mean she's supposed to be like in her at least 40 in this film right that's like what her character's supposed to be yeah. right so i mean that that makes her like in this marriage for like 20 years being so unhappy you know but i do what i do want to mention is you know they kind of because her character is supposed to kind of be this lonely depressed woman she kind of starts out looking a lot older than she is first several scenes with her but in this specific scene she like you can see how attractive she really is her hair is down is like nicely brushed and she's got makeup on and you know she looks very like more presentable and not presentable but you know what i mean like more made up and it's just kind of it's like oh she she actually is a pretty woman it's just kind of stuck in the situation that makes her so depressed and maybe not as attractive yeah if anything this affair just made you know the person she was like she just blossomed into like you could argue the person that she's meant to be like you said she looks very casual she's wearing sunny shirt like she's obviously like very happy in this moment right now you know they're having like not just like you know a sexual bond this is an emotional bond that they're, they're talking about each other's lives they're sharing secrets about their lives with each other you know they're asking like intimate questions like you said like with sunny like you know why don't you just leave coach and she tells them why and it's just they have this this strong emotional bond now, and it's causing her just as a person to kind of just blossom into seemingly a whole other being that it was just hidden under that layer of that depressed housewife. Cloris Leachman, I mean, I know we did the little bit jewelry at the beginning, but seriously, this was an amazing performance. Because essentially you're getting two different characters in a sense, because you have like Ruth at the beginning, like, you know, the depressed Ruth, and then you get the Ruth here, which is way, like, on the opposite end of the spectrum on the emotional scale. But then the best thing about it is at the end of the film, we kind of get a combination of the two in an um, amazing scene, which we're going to get to at the end. But, like, I love how, like, you get the, the two different Ruths kind of all c combining into, like, this this explosive scene at the end. I mean, I'm, exactly. I mean, I'm excited to talk about it, but it speaks to Cloris Leachman's talent. Yeah, absolutely. The next scene, this is where the movie clicked in for me. This is whatever uh, Sonny goes to the tank of water. This called a tank. I don't know. Like, I'm assuming it's like a man-made thing of water to go fishing with yeah. Sam, the lion and Billy. This is a scene. This is little, this specific scene is what clicked the movie in for me because Sam, like you said, this is what got him his Oscar. This is what Ben Johnson is Oscar. He kind of sits there and talks about marriage and, and women and he tells a story. First time I watered a horse at this tank was more than 40 years ago. I reckon the reason why I always drag you out here is probably I'm just as sentimental as the next fella when it comes to old times. Old times. I brought a young lady swimming out here once. More than 20 years ago. It was after my wife had lost her mind that my boys was dead. 
Me and this young lady was pretty wild, I guess. And pretty deep. We used to come out here horseback and go swimming without no bathing suits. <laughs> One day she wanted to swim the horses across this tank. Kind of a crazy thing to do, but we'd done it anyway. She bet me a silver dollar she could beat me across. She did. This old horse I was riding didn't want to take the water. But she was always looking for something to do like that. Something wild. I bet she still got that silver dollar. Whatever happened to her? Oh, she growed up. She was just a girl then, really. Here, let me help you then. Why didn't you ever marry her after your wife died? She was already married. Her and her husband was young and miserable with one another, like so many young married folks are. I thought they'd change with some age, but it didn't turn out that way. Being married always so miserable? No, not really. About 80% of the time, I guess. We ought to go to a real fishing tank next year. I don't do to think about things like that too much. If she was here, I'd probably be just as crazy now as I was then in about five minutes. Isn't that ridiculous? No, it ain't really. Because being crazy about a woman like her is always the right thing to do. And it's, it, like, really got me. Like, I was like, oh, my God, yes, give him that Oscar. It was, this is an amazing performance. I mean, the <laughs> What, what what else could be said about this scene? Like the way he sits there and he's just so matter of factly, like just telling the story, like it's a life lesson, you know. Like the way he's just so, I guess, is the the most emotional that we see. Like Ben Johnson as Sam, just reminiscing about like probably the happiest moment of his life, you know, after like you know all the tragedy that had happened to him up to that point. Like he had this one moment with this one girl, and it just kind of it stuck with him his entire life. And I love how cameras just slowly zooming in on him as he's telling the story. Like, you know, if, if as if the words themselves weren't important to you, like the camera itself is telling you, hey, listen to this guy. He has something to tell you. And it's just slowly, slowly going up. It's, you know, zooming in on Ben Johnson until we get this really nice close up of him near the end of the story that he's telling, where he just, you just see his face like, He's reminiscing, and you could tell, like, this was the probably the best moment of his life. This, you know, this one night he spent with this girl at, at the tank here, and it just hits you, man. Like, because we all have those stories. And yes, Adolfo, this was the um, this was the moment where, like, I sat up because it, it, it was it was half to do with Ben Johnson's performance of, of this scene, and then half of the cinematography, like, with the camera and how it's just zooming toward him like just slowly like we're getting that close up and that's like the signal to the audience like you better listen to this guy right it was this scene that made me just kind of sit up and then just listening to sam and at the end of it you're just like whoa because like i said we all have stories like this like every every single person i would like maybe i'm romanticizing you know life a little bit but i feel like every person on earth has a story like this and it just it hits you hard man this was amazing and you mentioned the cinematography. It's uh, what's great about this is that so Bogdanovich wanted to do this in one take, and you can see that they that, that the attempt is there for the one take because as you said, as he starts telling the story, the camera starts slowly zooming in, and then he kind of tells like the meat of the story, and then as he starts like kind of backing away, it's like after the story's over, that's when the camera backs away. They shot it outside on location. And it was a, kind of an overcast day. And as the camera pulls out, like the sun kind of popped out from under the clouds. And then you kind of see his his face kind of light up for a little bit. And it's a very beautiful like effect. And it was completely by just accident because Mother Nature did it. But the thing is, right. such a beautiful shot, such a beautiful performance. But during the middle of the speech, uh, Sonny, Timothy Bottoms was supposed to have a line. 
and forgot it. So like Bogdanovich, you know, kept repeating the line, repeating the line, and just uh, Timothy Bottoms wouldn't get it. So they finished the scene without the line, and he went. He kept, you know, finished this, uh, finished his take. And they said because Timothy Bottoms forgot his line, they did another take where everyone got their lines right. And uh, of course, when they went back to the editing room, you know, the first take uh, that had the interruption in it was obviously the best performance. So he had right. to cut out the part where Timothy Bottoms forgot his line, and it's technically not a one take anymore. And that annoyed him. <laughs> I mean, like you said, the attempt is there, and props to Bogdanovich for trying to do it that way, but, you know, it didn't work out. But we still got. The, the the scene that the final cut of that scene is still I mean it got Ben Johnson his Oscar so yeah and there's a line in there that as soon as I heard it I was like I just I, it it really hit me hard like like the that's one of those like deep cowboy lines and he's like when he says I think Timothy Bottoms asked him something about like if he read it or something like that. he's like no being crazy about a girl like that is always the right thing to do such a great line. <laughs> It's a great line. Yes. That's a badass line. We need to discuss uh, New Year's Eve. Yes. So the boys, the Dwayne and Sonny, decide that they want to take a trip down to Mexico. Uh, and it's heavily implied that they're going to be there for a lot of drinking and maybe a lot of gambling and probably some time spent with some ladies of the night. So before they go, they stop by uh, Sam's and they're just, you know, and this is another really great little scene with, with Sam, but he's just uh, what they tell him what they're going to do. And he clearly looks like like nostalgic for a moment, He kind of wishes he could go with them. And then yeah. afterwards, he kind of gives them this like kind of final look before they take off as they say goodbye. So it's a very pointed look. And because the next scene we find out as the boys are coming back into town after their kind of weekend of debauchery, they see Sam's closed. They see the diner closed, the movie theater's closed. And they're kind of really confused about what's going on. And after they ask some, like, local dude that just hangs out on a doorstep, uh, you know, what's going <laughs> on? And he's like, oh, yeah, you boys don't know. Uh, Sam died on New Year's Eve. He had a stroke and he died. This came... So, like... I saw the movie before, so I knew he died. But when I watched it this time, it felt like way more of a gut punch. You know, even though I knew it was coming, uh, it felt like way more of a gut gut punch because this is this because it was almost immediately after his amazing scene when he's talking about that the time with the one girl. You know. Yeah, and then um, I mean, you can see like I think Timothy Bottoms here is really good. Just he doesn't really say anything, but it's just the facials. The facial expressions you can see on him as he got this news, like you could tell he had he just got a gut punch, right? Like it's just you 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 see his face and you feel that like it's not some like this is something that you don't you know he didn't have to like say anything like oh I'm I'm so sad no just his face makes you sad <laughs> if I said like like you know realizing that Sam died wasn't bad enough you see like. You know how much Sam meant to Sonny, and seeing his face once he hears the news, like it's a gut punch to the audience because now you feel for uh, for Sonny, and it's just like it's it's just double double the the emotion. We find out that uh, in Sam's will, he left you know the diner to Genevieve, he left the movie theater to the old lady who runs a concession stand, and interestingly enough, he leaves the pool hall to Sonny and it's it's just kind of an it just like so after he finds that out too it's like clearly Sonny meant a lot to Sam just as much as Sam meant a lot to Sonny and it was this mutual father-son relationship right. that to two people who didn't have sons or a father and I think he also left money to the preacher's kid which might end up being a yeah. bad investment in the end but yeah <laughs> that story was We'll talk about it, but that story always seems a little odd. Um, yeah. So then we get to uh, we show a funeral and two interesting kind of well, characters. This is a, this is a great here. scene. Yes. As they're kind of lowering Sam's body in, you see Billy. He's wearing his, you know, his dopey little hat, and Sam tries to take it off, but then Billy puts it back on, and then Sam just or Sam Sonny, uh, and Sonny just kind of lets him get away with it because he doesn't know any better, and the. He doesn't, I don't think he even realizes what happened to Sam. And then you've got a shot of Ruth, and she's looking, even though she's at a funeral, she's in a very nice little dress with her sleep with no sleeves on, looking very pretty, even though she's at a funeral. And then you also get a shot of Lois. So we see Lois 
be kind of affected by this man's death. We find out a little later why. Yeah, to the point where she actually like runs away after as they start lowering sand like she runs away from the from the funeral so yeah, and at this point all we know about her is she's jc's mom she's rich and she cheats on her husband that you don't have any really other knowledge so of not a, not a very high high standard for moral character so having, <laughs> having you know, her when you really think about it. exactly so having her kind of cry on camera it kind of leads the audience to be like, what is going on with her? Um, but then, but see, but when you see that happen, when she when she leaves the funeral the way she does, like even on my first viewing, I was starting to get the light bulbs in my like, wait a minute, we'll talk about that later. The kids, uh, I don't know if it's like spring break or something, but there's something. It's they haven't graduated yet, but there's some sort of big thing with all the kids in town. Dwayne and like the summer picnic or something like that, spring picnic. Yeah. Dwayne and JC uh, go to a motel, and she clearly wants to have sex and have her. Virginity, uh, have her virginity be gone so she can start dating Bobby. And <laughs> they get undressed. Dwayne is very excited, but he can't quite live up to expectations. And I don't get why. I really, <laughs> this scene always confuses me because of like how, like he's been waiting for this for how long in the movie? And it's finally happening and he can't, like, he can't get it up. Like what the heck, man? Like you have one job, but I just well, find it funny. I get it. It can happen to anybody, including twenty-year-old Jeff Bridges. So. Yeah, because that's believable, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so they had a. Uh, so after this point, um, they have a big fight, and you can see uh, after he walks home, after he walks out, you see all these people were like knew what was gonna happen, and he's just kind of <laughs> looking at them, I and they all scene, know. Bro. They all know that. They what they think they know and they actually don't. <laughs> but she tells him before he walks out the door, like, you know, if anybody asks, we did it. <laughs> so and JC was so annoyed with him, but she still, like you said, she wanted to prove that she did it. And so two of her friends like bolted into the room after Dwayne left, and she's like, It was indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> well, she wasn't lying there. After that, we get the graduation night with all the kids, and they're singing this really dopey song. Uh, I think it's their alma mater or something. And during the song, you see Dwayne kind of talk to try to get JC's attention as they're singing. And he's like, hey, let's do it again. I, I can do it this time. She's like, no, you had your chance. And but then to try to have this conversation in the middle of the song. Yeah, it's just, again, like Sonny says later, he's pee whip still. <laughs> but But see, again, like he's still obsessed over her, but like he couldn't get you know can get business done when 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 the time came like i I don't get that i don't know whatever so next scene afterwards they come out of a motel you see them both come out of a motel room and you see um dwayne is very uh pr very you know peacock he's peacocking he's proud of himself and jc just has this like okay whatever look and then she gives a funny lines like quit prison you i don't think you did it right anyway yeah <laughs> that's right yeah that's a great scene shortly then after this we get a, a um a scene where another one of these scenes where i think this is probably this the peak of her happiness where uh ruth meets meets sunny and he like runs into runs into the room and she like passionately embraces him and we see that she got him this really nice i think it's a wallet with his name on it um, yeah. she's very, she's like clearly very much in love with Sonny. Yeah. That's, that's, like you said, that's a great scene too, because like at this point in the relationship, like they're, they're like so connected to each other at this point. Like, like Ruth remembered like to get him a graduation gift, you know, and, and he likes to give, like, he's thankful for it. And, you know, they just, just the way they look at each other, even just little things like that. Like you can tell, like at what point they are in, in their relationship you know like they're, they're like they're fully in man yeah after this we get a seat at the the pool hall where sunny is calling up calling up late jc i was gonna say lacy calling up jc dwayne yeah dwayne who did i say you said sunny dwayne calling up jc uh basically wondering why she hasn't been like why she's been ignoring him and she's basically like, yeah we're broken up now and uh you know i'm gonna go see bobby sheen now and he like tries to get a beggar to stay and he's <laughs> she's like nope bye i'm done so again, she got what she needed from him so that she can get what she wanted. And then like at this point, like, he pretty much just breaks down like to the point where he leaves town after this, right? Because he can't be anywhere near her. Yeah, it's one of those things where he, like that first half of the movie, this first like hour of the movie before he leaves town, I'd say Sonny and both Sonny and Dwayne are both the main characters. 
And then at this point, he kind of leaves the movie for a while yeah. so that it really is just Sonny's story. Then we find out that after this, that JC, who's sitting, who's basically sitting around watching TV looking bored, she, who was saving herself for uh, Bobby Sheen uh, to be a romantic partner, she finds out that Bobby Sheen went off and got married, so she never got to have her cho- have her uh, chance with him. <laughs> well, that's what she gets. That, that's what I said when that, that scene came, when she found out, like, oh, well, that's what you get. Play stupid games, win stupid price. And speaking of that, she does another stupid game here. She, as Abilene, mother's lover and her father's employee, uh, comes in to talk to his dad about something, her dad about something, but he's in home. And she basically, quote unquote, seduces him. But really, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. They take him down to the pool hall. Which he had a key. For, nobody... well, no, she, oh, he had a key for the pool hall, right? Which yeah, I don't he get. got like, in. I don't know that how he a, got That was a weird, uh, a little weird, like, maybe plot hole. I don't want to call it a plot hole, but, like, because now Sonny owns the the pool hall. So, like, why would he let this guy have a key still, you know? Even if Sam See, let him have the key, like, why would Sam let him have a key anyway, knowing, like, you know, what he what they knew about each other? Like, that's just, it's just weird. I don't know, because I, I I was wondering, because did he did he have a key, or is it just, like, this this town is, like, so ho-hum and nobody's going to steal anything anyway that he just didn't lock it? No, I, I think he, there's, like, a, 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 a throwaway line that he tells her, like, well, I have a key. Good, no, because he, he goes, like, well, oh, why don't we go down to the pool hall? And she goes, like, wasn't right. it close? You're right. Like, well, I have a key. Right. Um, so basically, they get into the, the pool hall, and um, she was, clearly was thinking she was going to seduce him, but he basically comes, you know, basically just has his way with her. Yeah. Not in, On like, it's consensual, table. but it's it's consensual, but she clearly put more thought into she it. She clearly put too much thought into this than than what, what was actually needed, because... Right. She didn't have to try very hard for this. Now, I don't know if it's just part of your production notes, but what I found fascinating, and I just found this out too, that this was not in the original cut of the film. Like, I didn't know, like, the 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 the, the film that, you know, we got in 1971, I think was when this came out, if I'm not mistaken, 1971, that that was not the director's cut. Like, there was actually, like, stuff cut out of this that wasn't supposed to, and this this pool hall scene was one of them. Yeah, they, I think um, they cut to the before and the after, but they don't leave, do the, the during. And, yeah, it, I was going to mention that a little later, but, yeah, the, the only version I think anybody has seen, like, in recent years would be the director's cut because the according to my research the the 71 cut doesn't exist anymore every like home media release has released the director's cut with all the footage back in and i think there's uh, some old vhs's that still yeah, have like it VHS's, but like those are rare yeah, exactly like the, but any dvd or blu-ray or streaming you'll see it's going to be the director's cut but yeah i had that in my notes as well they have sex on the pool table afterwards he kind of just just drops her off without like <laughs> he caring drops her off <laughs> Like a, he drops her like a bad habit, bro. Yeah, just like so and, old and so like emotionless. Like I got what I wanted. Like you can leave now. Exactly, exactly. And that guy obviously very creepy. Not only is he having sex with his boss's wife, but he's also just had sex with his boss's daughter, and she probably underage. You know, so well. Yeah. And the, I don't know if in the fifties, uh, what the laws were about that, but to by today's standards, he'd probably be underage. I mean, since she's just graduated high school, I think we're to assume she's already 18 anyway. Yeah, but there, she could also be 17. You can graduate. She her. could be. But I think they want us to assume she's 18. <laughs> so we don't uh, question it. It's still, it's still, he's, she's still a it's, high school it's, student. It, and it's still, it's he's still, still wait. She's still way too young for him. So Yeah. Wait, still wait. Either way. <laughs> um, so what's interesting here is that I actually had to get a little. I was listening. I don't. I don't know if it was a commentary track or one of the interviews where. So in the film, you just see, kind of Lois get up when she hears a car door, and then she sees Lacey or JC. Why was one called Lacey? JC, um, and then she pieces together what just happened. But I think I've heard Ellen Burstyn kind of added the note that she she knows what Abilene's car would sound like. So when the so when it's pulling up, she gets up thinking it's Abilene, but it's really uh, JC, and then that's how he puts she puts together that she had just slept with him. But I don't feel like that's communicated like she knows what his car sounds like. But that's what Ellen Burstyn said. So I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean they don't really make that clear in the movie either. So it, I mean. Other than, you know, her saying it herself, like, you really can't tell. I mean, unless there's something that we're missing. So after this, we get this really, this scene in this story, I don't even know, what this should have been cut out, really. Um, the whole thing with uh, Jim, Joe Bob, 
uh, and the little girl. Uh, you know, at the pool hall one day, like some local guy runs in and is like, hey, they're, police are after Joe Bob. He took a little girl and they think he's going to molest her. Um, and we see the cops and the, some townsfolk drive up to to where they think Joe Bob is. It's his name, right? Joe Bob. Um, and uh, Joe Bob Blanton. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Bob Blanton. Not Joe Bob Briggs, everybody. Joe Bob Blanton. Let's not get him confused. <laughs> and uh, he's, um, you know, still parked in his car, and he's got the little girl in the front seat, and he's not moving anywhere. He's clearly had some sort of attack of conscience. Basically, you find out that he took off her underwear, and then, oh, you know, you, you, the you police... need to shoot that guy on sight. I would have yeah. shot that guy on sight, man. You know, they, they grab him, and they arrest him, and the uh, the lady, who's mo- the mother, <laughs> starts like, beating the crap She's out of him. slapping him around. I love that part, bro. She's just like, she's like what is the matter with you? She just starts slapping him right the cops taking him away. Yeah, and then um, it was funny as that as the you know you from you get the shot of the the Joe Bob getting you know taken away, and then you see the 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 mother like kind of getting escorted away, and then like as if an afterthought, there comes a little girl like walking way behind. Like the mother's not even paying attention to the little girl. Yeah, again, like this this is kind of just like a tangent. Like there's really, I mean, it goes kind of goes to I guess Bogdanovich's greater theme, which we'll talk about at the end uh, about the town. But I mean. As far as, like, you know, right now we care about, like, Sonny, Dwayne, those guys. And, like, this is kind of just an unnecessary, like, fork in the road when it comes to this story. Like, it really just has no bearing on anything else. Yeah, it, it just, it's a, it's an unneeded subplot. Like, uh, I don't really know why we needed that in there. But anyway, in our next scene, we see that, uh, we see JC drive up to Sonny after, like, he's about to go over to Ruth's house. But she drives up to him and, and basically kind of unites him along on, on a drive. And he does it. He's very hesitant, but then she gives his little, his little hand a little squeeze there, and kind of looks at him with like come hither eyes, and totally seduces uh seduces Sonny. <laughs> and but, we, um, but, but I think we forget to mention though why this happened. Because remember, there's a uh, there's a scene with um I think it's she's talking with her mom with Lois, and they're talking about like I, I think she mentions like you know that she got rid of Dwayne, which Lois and we didn't she, Lois didn't like Dwayne anyway, right? So then right. she's talking about, you know, like, oh, what about Sonny? Like, well, you know, and she, I think she tells JC that Sonny's with Ruth. Like, the whole town knows at this point, like, except for Coach, apparently. Maybe he does know. Like, I don't know. But that, you know, Sonny and Ruth are an item. And then she gets offended because it's like, well, why is he, you know, l- you know, trying to take me out? Like, why is he interested in this old hag, basically, Ruth Popper, when I'm right here? So that's when she, like, she tries to, like, seduce him. That's when she, like, drives up to wherever he's at. I forgot what he's doing, but. And she takes him on a ride. Yeah, and you know he doesn't want to at first because he wants to go meet with, up with Ruth, and she like is like yeah she kind of seduces him into the car. Uh, oh, and then they show that, that that that's yeah they show that scene of Ruth getting ready for for him to come and <laughs> it's just such a sad and, scene. And she looks so pretty, and you know she's so happy because yeah. she's putting up she's wallpaper. Up, yeah. And the thing is, the wallpaper is is that. Sonny inspired the the wallpaper for her to wallpaper the room at all, like in the first place. Because after like the first or second time they they were with each other, she's like, "This is an ugly room." She's like, "What's your favorite color?" And he's like, "Is it blue? I'm gonna put a blue wallpaper." Now it's black and white. I can't tell if it's blue, but you see her putting up the wallpaper, and she's very happy because she's doing this thing for Sonny that or at least inspired by Sonny. You know, she's she's got her hair like all done up and she's got this big smile on her face and then you just and oh, but oh, you know that uh somebody's just out with getting played by this uh little devil girl basically go off and she drives drives off with him and they have some roadside making out uh and then we cut back again to Ruth who's like in a dress and made up and everything she's like looks very fancy and he she's there by herself looking very sad <sighs> Horrible scene, man. I, obviously, like you know, just Cloris Leachman's body language—it just says it all, and it makes you feel sad with her, and it makes you hate JC even more than you probably already do at this point as an audience member. In our next scene, we see that uh, Dwayne has come back into town. He he meets up with uh, Sonny, and he kind of very casually, uh, very casually starts talking to him like they're old buddies. But as, as the conversation keeps going, he gets a little more aggressive and aggressive. 
uh, until we come to the point like he's like, what, you still screwing that old lady? And then, <laughs> uh, and then we eventually get to the topic of JC. Why are you dating her? She's, she's my girl. And she's like, she dumped you. She, <laughs> she's going to college. She's not your girl anymore. And then they get into a pretty big fight. Yeah, because I think that's when he, when he tries to like get under his skin. He's like, you know, well, you know, you were always pee whipped about her. And like when he says pee, that's when like he, like Dwayne, like kind of just loses it and they start fighting. And well, he, he bashes a bottle over his head right next to his eye. And then after that, uh, he kind of runs off while Dwayne is in the hospital. Oh, and this hospital scene is another depressing scene. <laughs> but before we get uh, to that real quick, real quick, before we get to the hospital scene, one interesting thing is that this is like a bigger movie for Bogdanovich at the time. And he, you know, he, when he would do setups for his shots, the cinema, this must have been one of the early scenes that they filmed, but the cinematographer tried to tell Bogdanovich, are you going to set up a master? And Bogdanovich didn't know what a master shot was. So he was like, <laughs> it's, it's that's, I like, heard the story. That's right. Yeah. He's like, it's the scene without any camera movements, but from, from, from a far shot. So we record everything. And he's like, why do we need that? He's like, well, we need it for the editors. He's like, no, it'll be fine. So he basically, <laughs> um, so the, so I guess they call back to like the, back to the studios and they're like, uh, can you look at some of these dailies? Cause we're concerned that, that maybe Peter doesn't know what he's doing and we need, you know, and, uh, who was, it? I think it was Bob Rafelson to, took a look at the dailies. And then afterwards he's like, oh, it's fine. Uh, he's cutting in the camera. And the thing is that what uh, I guess this producer, whoever was kind of narking on him, didn't realize that. I think it was Schaefer. That. That's what one of the yeah. BBS guys. I think it was Schaefer. OK, yeah. But yeah, it's, he was just cutting in the camera because he didn't know how he wanted. Uh, I guess he, he knew what it would look like. He set up every single shot and he filmed them in order. So basically, if you're an editor, you just go, oh, I just put this here, 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 here. I don't need to do anything else. Um, so, so he cut because he cut in the camera, and that's a very um, it's a thing that some directors do. I, I've heard Kevin Smith talk about how he cuts in the camera. He gets he knows the shot he wants to do. He does not he does not want another shot, so he gets that shot, and that's the only shot he's going to do. And that that is a thing that some editors do. So this is when we get to the 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 hospital scene and. It's yeah, like you said, one of the most depressing things. Yeah, so Sonny's in the hospital, but all banged up. He's like, he's got his eye bandaged up. He's like basically in like a head cast, in a sense. And um, so he's just sitting there on bed in the bed, and then the nurse comes in, and she goes, you know, I have this, uh, this, there's a lady here, you know, in the front that she wants to see you, but she wanted me to give you this note first. So you know, he takes the note, and it's from Ruth. Obviously, she goes like, you know, can I come come in to see you? And then just Sonny just cold-heartedly just says to the nurse, like, can you tell her I'm asleep? Like, it, it, and it's, I don't know if Bogdanovich is going for, like, maybe a juxtaposition, maybe a comparison between him and Abilene, because it's, like, the in the same way that, like, you know, Abilene just kind of just dumped JC when he was done with her, it seems like Sonny's almost doing the same thing, because he's so obsessed with JC now that, like, he's just, oh, well, no, who cares about Ruth, so. <laughs> but that's just very cold and very uncharacteristic of Sonny to do that, but, I mean, he's just, he's under her spell. Just like all the other guys were. Yep, exactly. And uh, speaking of which, the next day after, or not the next day, but after he's out of the hospital, uh, he's just hanging out in the pool hall. He's talking to Genevieve, who basically says, that girl's trouble. She's, you know, probably better off without her. As she walks out to, like, go get change or something, she sees that JC is just rolling up, and she got, it's just a great close-up of, like, Genevieve as she, like, kind of looks at, looks at her roll up, and then she kind of just walks off in the... As if she's like, well, I know what's going to happen here. I'm not going to be around for it. <laughs> and basically, um, JC uh, convinces Sonny to go and elope with her because she's, you know, she can't believe that someone would fight for her like that. <laughs> yep. I mean, this is a great scene. But I think this is probably my one of probably my favorite scene with Sybil Shepherd because she has such great chemistry with, with Timothy Bottoms here and just the way that she's just convincing him. And she has that, that at this point, she's gone like full devil, at least in the eyes of the audience, right? But she has like that that look, that like charming, like beautiful, like, you know, siren look that like, you know, anybody, like, you know, even like you could sit there and say, oh, you know, I mean, I'm too smart, you know, to fall for her, fall for any of her tricks. But like, just one look at her face, and like you're you're you're, you're done. You're, you're, you're under her spell. And she's like, Sybil Shepherd just has that like that look and and it's not just you know her physical appearance like 
that's this is her acting. Like this is her body language. It's just the facial expression she does. Like she just evokes that like you know temptress look, right? And that just it's it makes the scene work, and it, it makes you understand like why even though like this is she's a horrible woman. Why Sonny would even fall for this? Yeah, but he's young and dumb, you know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So we get our next scene is them kind of driving in. I think it's from Oklahoma because they have to get that's where they have to get eloped, I guess. They're driving back and, you know, they have clearly already eloped on their way. They're driving back into town and JC's the one driving and she's kind of getting a little irritable, you know, because he's you know, Sonny's clearly in love and he's trying to like kiss her and maybe do other things with her. And she's just kind of pushing him off, pushing him off. And then she's clearly annoyed, and she keeps looking over him with his eye patch, kind of grossed out by his eye patch. And then she says, "Oh man, it would be so bad if my mom and dad got us arrested or in trouble." And she she's like, "Well, she's like, well, why would that happen?" It's like I left them a note about where I was going. I remember first seeing that, and I'm just sitting there like, "But why?" I had like that uh, that Ryan Reynolds uh, gif. But why, right? Like, why? If you were serious about like eloping with somebody and like in secret, why would you leave a note behind? Say, oh, this is oh, we're gonna go elope. Isn't that like just counterproductive? But then, like, when you realize what's happening here, it's like, oh, this witch with a B, bro. This witch. <laughs> uh, but but keep going, man. This just it, it, now this game, my blood's boiling, man. Yeah, and then as they're driving, they pass cop. And she, like, gets this excited look, like, oh, cop is going to come. And then, you know, when they, briefly the, the cop keeps going, and she gets disappointed, but then she sees that he's, he's turned around. So they, the cop pulls him over and basically says, yeah, we got people, we're looking for a young couple, you got to come with me. They go back, and the next shot is like an anger, like a smash cut, basically, to JC's father basically yelling at the camera POV, uh, basically saying, I didn't work like a dog for her to marry some pool hall owner, blah, 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 and giving him the third degree. I think it's his only real scene in the entire in the entire movie. Yeah. Um, and he basically, you know, they eventually get it obviously annulled, but you see that whenever he's taking, you know, her dad kind of grabs her and takes her to the car. She gives this look back at Sonny, like, like kind of like a, oh, well, kind of look, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's what Sonny realizes, like, so Sonny realizes he, he's been girl, had. This he's girl messed had. me up. Yeah. Yep. So... Lois ends up because there's two. They needed two cars. Lois ends up driving uh, Sonny back to the to town because he didn't want. He's not going to ride with. He wasn't going to ride with uh, her dad at that point. They kind of have a little bonding moment in the car. She gives him some booze and then she kind of opens up to him. And we find out that she was the girl that in Sam's story, you know, 20 years ago, she was the girl in Sam's story. And the reason they never stayed together was because she was married. Then that adds a whole lot to the dynamic between everybody. Yeah, and then this this scene here, Ellen Burstyn was so good. This is this earned her her nomination for supporting actress because I think it was her and Cloris that were nominated the same category for supporting actress, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And but th- and this scene got her that nomination because like the way she just kind of opens up to Sunny and the way just that she's even. You see it in her face, so she's reminiscing, you know, about you know the situation in Sunny's story, and then Sunny in 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 Sam's story. Like she's even she's looking back on it, and she's she's smiling, and, and to an extent, maybe you would she would even agree that's probably like the best time of her life as well. And like you said, the reason they couldn't stay together is because she was already married. But like you know, the stars were aligned differently. Like she she definitely could have ended up with Sam, and I think that's the 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 tragedy uh, uh, of it all, right? You know, looking back on that, she tells Sunny, you know. You're you're meant for Ruth. You're not meant for JC. You know, like if if you're to go by like you know you know Sam's example, like you need to you know stay with the person that you're you know you're aligned with emotionally, and that person is Ruth. Like you know you shouldn't go after JC. Like obviously, I mean I don't think she meant to put down her daughter the way she did, but it's like but it's true. Like he had no connection to JC, like anything near what he has with Ruth. So you know she's just basically telling him like you know follow that path. Yeah, this is a great. Just a lovely bit of acting uh, by Ellen Burstyn. And what's interesting here is that this plays out differently in the book, apparently. In the book, they have this moment, and then they go have sex. <laughs> this is not happened in the movie. Well, I think that's better. it's better off this way. <laughs> it, oh, just, totally. it, it makes, I, it, it it makes have... it more resonate, you know? Yes, exactly. So now we see t- enough time has passed, and it's already it's the fall again because they're playing the 
teams playing football. Sonny is kind of filling in as like a, what is it, like a sideline referee or something? Like, what's he doing there? He's Yeah. He's, yeah. And he's talking to, like, the other guy, and the guy tells him about how, how he actually, the coach comes up and talks to him, making sure everything is on the up and up or whatever. He's like, you know, but he's trying to, like, be funny. He's like, why don't you stretch the stretch this a little bit? And then he's like, I oh, you know I, a good man doesn't cheat because you never can be a good man if you cheat or something like that. And he walks off, walking right by Sonny, who, you know, <laughs> yeah, what was he doing with his own wife? Uh, so it kind of resonated with him a little bit there. But yeah, so we see time has passed, but he, and he also finds out that, that Dwayne's back in town. He had enlisted in after the fight with where he broke the bottle over his face. Uh, he had enlisted in the army. They're about to ship him out to Korea. So suddenly decides to kind of go over and like men like patch fences up with with Dwayne and you know kind of have a like last hangout as bros. Uh, pretty much kind of just patch things up between the two. Obviously, the last time they saw each other, things ended very badly. So before Sonny ships out, I mean, I'm sorry, before Dwayne ships out, this was basically their attempt to kind of just mend the fences and try to repair what's left of their friendship. As they go hang out, what is one of the things they do? They go see the last picture show. As the movie theater is now is uh, closing due to, you know, bad business, and of course, I feel it's also because of it's also kind of like a sign that since Sam the Lion died, I feel like the movie theater is like a uh, it's a metaphor for, you know, since it's dying, too, in, in this dying right. town, you know. So the last they see the last movie at the at the movie theater, the last picture show of the title. And uh, do you trivia folks? Can you identify the movie that is the last picture show? Well, we hope they they can because this is pretty and I and a pretty iconic film starring the great John Wayne. Obviously, it's a uh, one of his uh probably one of his more more famous westerns. In case anybody hasn't figured it out yet or does doesn't know, it's Red River from the great 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 Howard Hawks. It's a great movie too. I would encourage anybody to see that. But yeah, that is the movie that they were playing. A funny story from Bogdanovich here is that in the book, I guess Larry McMurtry. I guess never really had much respect for the movies. So the last picture show that they were showing in the book was like some junky, like C movie Western. And Bogdanovich was like, decided to put in Rio Grande or not Rio Grande. Sorry. That's another John Red Dwayne Wayne movie, Red River, just cause he liked that movie. He wanted it to go out in like a, a big, like great movie from the era to go out drinking. And they, they had kind of this heart to heart in, in the car. Right? <laughs> and Sonny's, you know, Sonny picks up this uh, how to roll cigarettes from from Ben, sorry, from Sam the Lion. So he's sitting there rolling a cigarette and Dwayne's drinking a beer and they're kind of having a little heart to heart. And they kind of Dwayne says, like, hey, keep the car intact for me, you know, like uh, keep it keep it safe for me because he got got a new car with his with his money. Right. And then they kind of have a heart to heart where he's like, yeah, that whole JC thing that was effed up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's kind of the basis of the conversation. <laughs> that's pretty much you, you condense it to, yeah. Well, I condense it to like you know a line or two, like yeah. How about that? Wasn't that something? And then yeah, that's it. Yeah, we find out that JC's been in college and she never comes back home, and that's probably yeah, she's just never gonna come back home. And yeah, they have like this kind of quiet scene where, and then. Dwayne eventually just admits it's kind of a sad thing because here's this guy all full of confidence and youth and vigor. He's about to go into the army and he's still stuck on the one girl. But I love his line when he gets on the bus where he basically says to Sonny, you know, oh, well, I'll see you in a few years if I don't get shot. And he just goes yeah. on the bus. <laughs> just the way he says it, just so matter of factly, like with no emotion, like, oh, you know, you'll see me in a couple of years if I don't get shot. And then he just goes on the yeah. bus <laughs> and that's it. And that's it for doing. <laughs> After this, on a particularly windy day, and I think it's the same day actually. Sonny goes back to the pool hall. He's like opening up. And then he hears he hears a uh, a car like a car crash. He goes out and investigate, and it looks and it's that uh, Billy was out in the street sweeping this thing that he had, you know, been doing before, uh, just kind of sweeping in the streets because he didn't. It's just a little quirk he had, and he wasn't paying attention, and he got hit by a truck, and killed couple things the first thing is you gotta love the tumbleweed that just comes out of nowhere as he's trying to run toward the scene like you see the tumbleweed just kind of go across the <laughs> across the screen like just i mean now it seems cliche but it like i'm sure like th that's you know bogdanovich put that in there to emphasize you know this is pretty much this town is dead at this point right that you know you have like the tumbleweeds kind of like <laughs> running around here but second part of that is 
you know, just a reaction from like the the old geezers, like, oh well, he was good for nothing anyway. He was he was it was slow or whatever they called him. Like, you know, he didn't really like. He was kind. Of, he like kind of a useless life. He was useless. Like this is no big loss. And then, you know, Sonny just like starts ripping him because it's like you know how dare you say that about him? Like you know he his life mattered, and it's just like you know it's it's just a it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking scene, and you know Sonny kind of takes him over, puts his coat on him, puts his little hat on, and then yeah, just a really sad. It's just an awful moment. <laughs> and that's pretty well, um, that's pretty much how the movie ends, right? Because then you get like the you get one more shot of the town, which looks deader than it did at the beginning. Like pretty much a ghost town at this point. And then and then that's the movie. No, no, there's one more scene you're forgetting. Oh yes. Oh, <laughs> and I forget the most important scene too. Yeah, the exactly. Most important scene. Yeah. You see Sonny afterwards, he kind of gets in his truck and like tries to drive out of town, but then he see that he has like a a revelation and he kind of turns a car around and he shows up at uh, Ruth Popper's house. Now you got to figure that he started the whole affair with JC probably around uh, June ish. And this is probably around October because the, because they were wearing kind of fall jackets and there was football season going on. So like, so it's probably been about four months since he's seen Ruth and he never, he clearly has never called her, never, never seen her, never done anything to like, like make her know that you know she was alive even and all that completely ignored her cut her out of his life as the kids would say he ghosted her yeah as, the, as these kids would say today <laughs> that's right so he he goes to her house basically because he needs comfort he needs someone to comfort him and and be there for him when she opens the door she's shocked and she goes like you said like i don't want to take your point away because you were going to say that she had all these different roots that she was playing so so you go ahead because i don't want to take your point he's there because obviously billy had just died and he really has nobody else that he can you know talk to or you know kind of confide in sam is dead Dwayne is gone obviously if anything he had with jc is, is you know she's in school like she's she's gone like he's literally alone except for ruth so he tries to go to her house to kind of at least get i don't know if he's necessarily going there to patch things up with her but he just he needs somebody to just kind of emotionally lean on at this point he goes there obviously like she opens the door and you could just see in her face like she almost there's like a, a struggle there emotionally whether she wants to be mad but then she's also kind of happy to see him but there's like in her face you kind of just see that confusion in a sense right she lets him come in I think they sit in, in the kitchen and she basically just at the beginning, like, you know, she's kind of listening to him, you know, talk, but then she just kind of goes off and is like, you know, how dare you try to come here, you know, and try to get, you know, comfort from me when after the way you treated me, like you, I, I don't know what her exact words were, but she's basically, you know, saying like, you dumped me the way you did, you, you ghosted me. And, you know, when I had, you know, I, I, you know, I cared for you, like, you know, I thought we had a connection and then the way, you, you know, you kind of just ended things like, I'll never forgive that. Like, cause it's, and she's right, you know, and then it, it seems like she's just going to keep going off. I think she gets she like breaks like uh, the, the coffee cup, like she's making him coffee. And then like she just throws the, the cup against the wall, smashes it. And she just starts like going off on him. But you see Sonny's face and it's like it's I think he's still s so grief stricken over Billy that like it almost seems like he's like not really listening to what she's saying. And she notices that like she's see like he's in such a grief state that even like the words that she's using to him, like, you know, that you, obviously is very it's about how the relationship ended, but like, even she can tell that like, he's in another zone right now. And she's, uh, he's barely even listening to her. And she sees that. And it kind of, I guess her motherly instincts kind of kick in at that point. That's where we get like the infamous, like that, that final shot of them together where like, she basically like, you know, he outstretches his hand and she grabs his hand saying like, you know, I think her famous quote, like, never you mind, honey, never you mind. And while that relationship is obviously like broken still, like there's no way that you can fix this, but at least there's still the humanity there where she can like see that he's hurt and she's like, going to try to comfort him. So that's what I was talking about earlier with, with, you know, with Ruth, with Cross Leachman, you have like those two Ruths, like, like I said, you had the depressed Ruth and then you had like the, uh, the happy Ruth that we saw through most of the film. And then those two roots kind of clash here with like, she wants to be pissed at him forever for how he treated her and justifiably so. But then she still has that love, that emotion for him that she can't bring herself to do that. That's when that like emotional instinct kicks in and she just wants to just comfort him in this like trying time for Sonny. Like I said, while that relationship is probably dead, 
there's still that humanity in, in each other that she wants to just at least comfort him, you know, while he's grief stricken. And it's just amazing for both people from, from Timothy Bottoms and but especially from Cloris Lieberman to kind of just go through that whole range of emotions in such a short amount of time. It's just mwah, just amazing. Right. No, no, think for a moment. Think. If the sheep were Can I have a cup of coffee with you? I guess. I'm sorry, I'm still in the bathroom. Let's sing what's left of the last verse. Let's have a happy time, everyone. The last verse all together. Everyone. Mm, thank you, kindly. Mrs. O'Malley, out of the valley, suffered from ulcers, I understand. Never you mind, honey. Of grandma's life. Never you mind. The moment, like you said, where she where he grabs her hand, the, like, her reaction shot, like, where you see the tears fall down her face, just, like, chef's kiss acting right there. Um, and, he, and, you, and, it, and the film leaves on, like, that shot. Like, they're both, like, they're holding hands. They're comforting each other, at least with that, you know, physical, like, interaction. But as you can tell in their faces, she still looks, she's almost, she's, like, she's back to being depressed, even though, like, they're they're literally holding hands. But you see, like, her, her face, like, just look down and 
she almost kind of reverts back to her original state. And that's, I think, the biggest tragedy of all of this. And then, you know, after that, you kind of um, fade out on a, like you said, a windy, dusty town. I think and, it, it's, uh, the last shot is of, of the theater, the closed theater. Yeah, the Royal, I think it was what it's called. Uh, yeah. Bit of trivia, did, did you spot the other two movies they showed? So we talked about Red River and we talked about... Uh, Father of the Bride. Did you see the other the advert? Do you see the other two advertised movies? Um, I didn't see it, but I read which ones it were. I think one was a John Ford film, and I can't remember which one it was. But you, you go ahead. They were The Sands of Iwo Jima and Winchester seventy three. That's right. Yes, there you go. So Bogdanovich letting out his his nerd his film nerd out there. So yeah, so <laughs> yeah. that that is the uh, the last picture show. You know, one thing I did want to discuss, uh, like going back to going back to the relation the, with Sam the lion and uh, and uh, Lois. There's a moment, like I said at the beginning, when Abilene comes in and to, like buy cigarettes or whatever he's buying or pay for the pool, you know. And again, you see Ben kind of looking at Abilene, just this look, like this kind of very fleeting, like, "I know you, buddy. I know what you're doing," you know, because they both have a yeah. relationship with Lois, and yeah, it's just kind of very. It's just a little subtle stare down that I enjoyed. Another thing, too, is just I feel like just to me, I feel like Bogdanovich kind of made the relationship between Sonny and Ruth kind of like a stand in or kind of a reflection of the town itself. Because throughout the film, you kind of see like this is a small town in Texas, obviously, but it's like you can tell like it's on its last legs. Because, like, and especially in, in the opening shots, you see, like, a lot of, like, the gas stations are closed. And there's a lot of businesses, a lot of shuttered businesses. And it kind of looks kind of looks like a trash heap almost in a way. But you still have, like, some signs of life. You have, like, the pool hall. You have the diner. You have the movie theater. But then, you know, with Sam the Lion's death, like, that's almost like the, um, like the final nail in the coffin of the town. Because, you know, soon after, like, you, like we said, the movie theater closed. And then it's almost like the relationship between Sonny and Ruth is a reflection of the town itself where like, you know, you kind of had like the highs and then, you know, when that relationship ends, like so does the town because like, it's no coincidence to me that right after you see that final shot of them, like holding hands, but then looking like so completely depressed and lost and like dead that you see, a, you know, he does like a panning shot of the dead town finally ending on the dead movie theater where it's like, okay, like you kind of see like the connection there where, you know, this was a town on its last legs. And at this point now, it, it's it's a dead town. Yeah, I, I don't know what else to add to that. That's perfectly stated. The film has a pretty good legacy here. Uh, in the, when it was released, it made $29 million, which in 2021 dollars is $139 million. So very good money for like basically a small little feature. At the Academy Awards that year, uh, it was nominated for many awards. It was nominated for Best Picture Director, Supporting Actor for Jeff Bridges, Screenplay, a Cinematography, and Supporting Actress for uh, uh, Ellen Burstyn. And it won two, Supporting Actor for Ben Johnson, so Peter Bogdanovich was right, and Supporting Actress for Cloris Leachman. Alamo Draft has actually tweeted out a picture of her um, accepting the Oscar today as a tribute to her, which, I mean, she still looks gorgeous, man. <laughs> like, she, was a, she was a beautiful woman, inside yeah, and it, out. I think the Academy, the Academy Awards YouTube uh, channel I think they posted the video of, of of her acceptance, so I would seek that out. It's it's a very you know charming acceptance. And again, man, lost the legend there. In 1998, the Library of Congress selected the film for preservation in the uh, in the National Film Registry. It has ranked number 95 on the AFI's 100 movies. And interesting, you know, the last AFI movie list that they did was in 2008. They haven't updated that list in. 13 years and I actually just recently saw something on their website saying that they are planning to do another list but they're trying to get more diverse voices for the for like the opinions and things like that which I think is interesting okay. fair enough so yeah so um I don't know when there's no date on when that's going to happen but they they have announced that they're going to do another list which is interesting I mean let's assuming yeah assuming that this list comes out in 2021 I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, like, which films kind of remain on that 100 list and which, you know, don't when you have, like, 14 years worth of, like, quality stuff that you could possibly add to it, you know? And not, and not just that, but also all the stuff that maybe wasn't considered in the 90s and the 2000s, but in the 30 years since have been have become, like, 
cultural classics. So right. it's also so, like yeah. you could also have new editions of old movies, you know. So that'd be interesting. But again, there's yeah. no date. They don't know when they're going to do it. They just said that they're working on a list. Uh, uh, they're working on a way to get more diverse voices amongst their, you know, n- people that they would pull. And as you, as we mentioned before, there was a sequel called Texas Phil that was released in 1990. Uh, it brought back Bridges and Sybil Shepard, Cloris Leachman, Timothy Bottoms, Randy Quaid, Eileen Brennan, and Peter Bogdanovich came back to direct. Uh, it was shot in color this time instead of black and white. It did not do well. Rotten Tomatoes has it at a 55%, and the gross was $2 million on its $18 million budget. So Oof, a bomb a pretty much all the way around. And yeah. I was intrigued enough to think about maybe f- trying to find a way to watch Texas Phil. But then once I read about it, I was like, mm, no, no, let's not. <laughs> I'm not really interested. Well, what was funny about the, the whole Texas Phil thing well, was the reason they what, that they were kind of blaming on it bombing was the fact that there was, A, there was such a huge amount of time between last picture show and Texasville. And number two, at this point, like there was really like the home video market was just kind of in its infancy. So there was no way to actually, if people were actually interested in catching up, you know, with the last picture show before Texasville, there's really no way to do it because there was no way to watch the last picture show beforehand. So you're going into this, you know, on this, you know, 20 year old, almost 20 year old movie probably not remembering what happened or who these people are or just going into it, just not knowing what happened that you hadn't seen the last picture show and just not being interested at all. I mean, that's one of the reasons they came up with as, as far as like why it bombed the way it did. But the home video thing I kind of get because like if you're interested in like a sequel to like a movie, you kind of want to see the first movie beforehand or at least kind of catch up on it. And when you're not able to do that, it kind of kills any interest in the sequel. Or I wanted to watch a sequel, so I guess that makes sense. Yeah, but the other thing is, it's also uh, <laughs> apparently it wasn't very good either. So even if people went to see it, it still wouldn't have a very good reputation. Yeah, I mean, it it wouldn't have probably bombed financially the way it did, but yeah, the reputation would have still been there as far as quality wise. And the thing is, is that that movie ends perfectly. I love the I love the ambiguity of not knowing what happens to Sonny and Ruth. I don't want to find out what happens to them. I don't want to find out right. if. Uh, if um, Dwayne gets killed or not. And apparently he doesn't because he's in this movie. And I don't want right. to find out what JC did with her life. Like I'd like where my imagination would take that, you know? So it kind of bugs me that there's a, an official sequel out there that kind of tells me what happens to them. And I don't want to know that. Yeah, I agree. It kind of just takes uh, takes some of the luster out of the, out of the first film. I mean, the first film still stands on its own, but like, if I think if I were to see the movie that the sequel i would probably be like oh now it doesn't feel as nice yeah that's what i feel like too i feel like if i watch this it might take something away from last picture show so not that i'm actively avoiding it's just i feel like it's a little hard to watch too i don't know if it's really like out anywhere you know yeah um it you know it just yeah (laughs) anyway uh, (laughs) enough said you know it just bothers me because it's like it's it's kind of like they never should have done Toy Story 4 because it ruins Toy Story 3. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm not wrong. What he never would have done that. All right. So uh, the film is available um, on, it's not streaming anywhere for free, but you can uh, buy it digitally for about $13 in most places and uh, rent it for about $3 in most places. So um, it's. For I mean, for a digital purchase, fourteen bucks isn't bad. However, yeah. we here are proponents of physical media, so we uh, would both, I'm assuming, highly recommend the Criterion edition of this. Um, but it will come with a bit of a price because this Criterion edition, there's no single release of the Last Picture Show on Criterion. Uh, you can only get it as part of a box set called the BBS Story: America Lost and Found. That also includes Head, the, the Monkeys movie, Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, Drive, He Said, The King of Marvin Gardens, and The Safe Place. And it's usually about, I think, last time I looked, Amazon had it at $62. So not a, not a cheap release, but it's worth it for, to, for the movie and those, other, and those other films. Especially if you can get it during the Criterion sales. Like, it's, it's a huge, you know, you get a lot of bang for your buck. With this set, yeah, some of the special features on on the Criterion set. There's um there's a discussion with Peter Bogdanovich, like 20 minutes. He just kind of just not a lot a lot of new information in there. Um, there is a like an hour long like 
documentary that you, I think you brought up um, that that was filmed in 1999, and it was just inter- it was just talking head interviews with, um, you know, Cloris Leachman and Dennis Quaid and Jeff Bridges and uh, Peter Bogdanovich and so on and so forth. Um, did you say Dennis Quaid, bro? <laughs> what did I say, Dennis Quaid? You said, you said Dennis Quaid. <laughs> Randy Quaid. Jeez. I mean, I would have preferred Dennis Quaid, but uh, <laughs> Randy Quaid's fine. Yeah, they're the same thing. Uh, um, Wait, have you seen... Do you know he's playing Ronald Reagan in an upcoming movie? I heard about that. <laughs> okay. So someone... Po- I mean, I'm assuming it was the movie studio, but on social media, someone posted, like, a picture of Reagan, and then next to it, a poster for the movie Reagan with, like, him in that same pose. And it's, like, it's supposed to be, like, oh, look how close it is. And I just look at it, I'm like, okay, it's Dennis Quaid in a hat. Like, I don't... It doesn't look like Ronald Reagan at all. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to... I, I don't know anything about the quality of the film. I just know that um, it just looks like Dennis Quaid in a hat. It does not look like Ronald Reagan at all. Yeah. Well, I'm anyway, going to seek that out for myself and, and probably point and laugh at it like you did. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so there's that documentary. There's the other documentary that we talked about uh, the 1991 one uh, that has all the uh, actors coming back for the filming of Texasville, where they shoot, or where they interview some of the town locals. It's a great documentary. It's only like 30, 30 minutes long. It's not even that long, but it's really, really good. It's a really good companion piece to the movie. Yeah. Um, and it also has, I think, uh, those are the ones I saw. I think there's also like screen tests and. Um, I think there is a like Francois Truffaut interview. I did not see yes, that one. That's right, 1972. Yeah, that one I, I want. I still haven't caught uh, caught up with, but I'm sure it's good. So as we said, you can buy the digital for you know relatively cheaply, but physical media is the thing. So we should you should buy the Criterion set. Agreed. Um. So I think that's the last picture show. Do you have any closing thoughts on it? Um, not really. We pretty much ran through all the all the high points. Uh, what we were talking about is just personally, I think of Bogdanovich. I think of this movie because of just you know not only the quality of the story, but you know the, the just the quality overall of the, of the filmmaking itself, like with the cinematography and all of that, but also just the amazing array of actors put the story together. You know, especially, you know, now the late, great Cloris Leachman won her Oscar. Ben Johnson won his Oscar from this. This is this is their legacy. And, I mean, and, I, and I'm kind of ashamed in a way to kind of, you know, just kind of be so passe about it when I, you know, was first trying to watch it. Like I said, this was the last film I watched from that, from that BBS set. And afterwards, I, like I said, I looked back and I'm like, why did I wait so long to watch this? This is an amazing movie. And it just it and then all the emotional beats just hit even harder, you know, the the second time and then now the third time, the which was the most recent watch for this show. Uh and I think I I I don't know if I mentioned it while we we're talking, but the scene with uh with Sam, the 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 soliloquy he basically gave that was that's the point too. Like just like you, where that's when the, the movie hit me hard emotionally. So I mean just an amazing effort all around. Yeah. Um, totally re reshaped how I thought about the film. Um, and completely, yeah, completely deserves a spot in history and excellent piece of filmmaking. Um, the only thing I would say is like, we didn't touch too much on the, uh, the affair with, uh, Polly Platt or sorry, with Peter Bogdanovich and Sybil Shepard and how it affected, we touched a little bit on it. Um, it, just because it's not really about the movie, uh, so that's why I didn't really bring it up too much. But I will recommend something that the last season of the podcast, you must remember this, is all about Polly Platt's kind of career. Uh, and the chapters about surrounding um, Last Picture Show are especially good. So I would recommend seeking that podcast out. Sounds interesting. Will do. Um, actually, there's also a TCM podcast, which is like a series of interviews with Bogdanovich. So shout out to that too, because I know I forget what it's called. It's TCM, um, and it's yeah, it's just Ben Mankiewicz talking to uh, Peter Bogdanovich, and then kind of like for several episodes, and then kind of dropping in different clips of things. Um, and 
it's a good listen too. So I'd, I'd check that out. Yeah. All right. So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bust out our random movie generator to see what our next right. film would be. Okay. So here we go. All right, so our next film is going to be a doozy. It's going to be an epic. It's going to be a grand adventure, uh, as only old Hollywood could do. It's going to be Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, ho, 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 Omar Sharif, bro. That's all I got to say. <laughs> oh, this is oh, this is going to be ooh. That's is one of those great... movies that you you literally have to be in the mood for it because it's like it's 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 very long. So like you have to like dedicate a, your your day to it. To, like to really focus and kind of enjoy it for what it is. So I'm looking forward yeah. to that. It is a uh, 227 minutes, which is what uh, about three and a half hours. So yeah. not not long, not um, uh, not a not an easy watch. But I actually, it's weird because sometimes there are movies that are super long that I can actually have no problem watching in one sitting because I, I find them so good. Gone with the Wind is one of them. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia is another one. It's just to me, I'm like captivated when I watch that film. Um, and it, it's a, it's also kind of like Last Picture Show, where like the first time I watched it, I was probably too young to appreciate it. And then every single time I watched it after that, I just keep, I just like think, oh my God, this movie's awesome. So, uh, a grand. Yeah, we'll get into scale. it more. Um, yeah. We'll get into it more when we actually when we talk about it next episode. But, could, but this is one of those movies that I discovered with my mother because my mother is a huge fan of this movie. She loves Lawrence of Arabia, and I s first saw it through her. But I'll tell that story next time. Oh man, this is the moment. Oh, we'll talk about it. But when he just goes, "No prisoners," such a great moment. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Lawrence of Arabia is our next film, so make sure you uh, find a way to watch that film if you don't already own it. And I think that'll do it for us this week. Uh, just going to throw some quick uh, plugs out there. Uh, um, make sure to uh, visit EssentialFilmsPodcast.com. Um, also, the email here is EssentialFilmsPodcast at gmail.com. Like the Essential Films on Facebook and follow us on uh, at Essential Films on both Twitter and Instagram. And please, if you can, like, rate, and review and subscribe to us on iTunes because that will help our numbers go up. Mark, any plugs you would like to do? I'll start with plugging my Twitter account at SportsGuy515. I'm still semi-active there now after December. You know, you can catch some of my witty banter, some of my retweets there. Uh, you can also follow Force Perspective, our other show on Twitter at FP Movie Podcast. We have our first show of 2021 up. Uh, essentially a recap show of 2020, just talking about, you know, how the pandemic has affected everything, kind of screwed everything up. And we do a couple of reviews, Wonder Woman 1984 and for Mank, which is available on Netflix. And I think Wonder Woman just got taken down from HBO, I think, just it a couple did, days yes. ago. So the only way to see it now is go to the theater if you're up to it or wait for the Blu-ray, eventual Blu-ray DVD digital release. Um, but our review of the, of the movie is on there. Uh, next episode, which is probably coming up, should be up right before this episode, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe a little bit after, uh, we'll, you know, catch up more on the movie news. There's uh, a few things out uh, going around right now, but uh, we'll also get some reviews and probably for Trial of Chicago 7, um, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and a few other movies if we get around to watching them. But uh, uh, looking forward to that show uh, coming soon, uh, our next uh, Force Perspective episode. All right. So that'll do it for us. Um... So I've been thinking before we sign off here, uh, I always have like kind of trouble thinking of how to sign off. And, you know, sometimes I use a line from the movie if it's appropriate, but sometimes there's no like line that sticks out that would be, that would work as a goodbye. So I thought our, I thought of our tagline uh, as we close our show. And that is something that I truly believe in and something that I think all film fans should, uh, should, support and 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 take on as a as not only a slogan but a mantra and i think our new tag our new outro is going to be always buy physical media i can't say better than that i mean because it's such a truism and i'm not going to go into the whole thing right now because i could talk for hours about this but yes people buy physical media i can't physical say better media than that. is yours and no one can take it from you unless they 
physically steal it, but <laughs> but it's yours, and uh, the creators cannot do anything about it once it's in your hands. So, yep. On that note, we'll see you next time for Lawrence of Arabia, and remember, buy physical media. <laughs>